Hey everybody, um, this is the introduction, um, by, uh, Sean Matgamna of the Fate of the Russian Revolution, Lost Texts of Critical Marxism, Volume 1. Um, this is a very long introduction. It's like a book-length introduction. And so, I'm going to probably read it uh, section by section on its own. Um, this may uh, fuck up the actual uh, feel or the order, or I don't know, the feel of the text or whatever, but uh, no one wants to listen to a four-hour video. Um, so... I want to name out, while I'm here, I'm going to name out the uh, sections of Matt Gamna's, uh, the uh, introduction. Uh, the first section is called Constructing the Socialist Order. The second is called Bolshevism at Bay, Trotsky and the USSR. The quote, locum, end quote, and totalitarian economism, the neo Trotskyist and Stalinist expansion, Max Schachtman and James P. Cannon, and Trotsky and the future of socialism. So, the first thing, when, the one that I'm going to be reading in this video, is the constructing the socialist order section. Um, if you don't know the fate of, uh, if you don't know what this book is, um, it's a collection of, uh, basically, uh, the minority position, uh, the minority group within the Socialist Workers Party in the late 1930s, and then people who, uh, wrote within the Workers Party in the 1940s. And I'm not sure how far it goes into the 1940s or if it touches into the 1950s, but that's basically, um, okay, no, it does go into the 1950s, I believe, because it starts talking about, um, McCarthyism and the 1948 Fourth International, and it, it has critiques of, or reviews of, uh, Trotsky and, uh, uh, Later books by Max, I mean, um, Isaac Deutscher. So I think it goes into the 50s. But since I'm just, um, uh, this is the first thing that I'm reading from this thing, I'm going to read some of the, um, um, what was I going to say? I was going to read, uh, some of the, uh, the, like, the, introductory material, like the, the table of contents and shit. Um, but that's going to take forever. Um, but yeah, some of the people featured in here, I'll see who's in here. That make, actually makes more sense. Uh, Max Schachtman, Leon Trotsky, um, writings from the late from labor action, which was like the, uh, journal of, um, the workers party under Max Schachtman. Has pieces from James Burnham, Albert Goldman, uh, James Buchanan, who is the leader of the majority in, in the Socialist Workers Party, and which I think constitute about 60%. I think uh, the Socialist Workers Party lost 40% of its membership in the Schachtmanite split, uh, which... Um, which call it, which you know created the bifurcation of the you know, the Socialist Workers Party under Cannon's leadership and the Workers Party under Shackman's leadership. Has uh, Joseph Carter is in here. Uh, James M. Fenwick is in here. Uh, Hal Draper. Uh, Stanley Plastrick has some official documents from the Workers' Party. It has Albert Glotzer, uh, 
Herman Benson. Louis Coaster, who I believe was one of the people who started um, the journal Descent, but I'm not exactly sure. Has Felix Morrow, who I think Morrow was one of the people who tried to, who advocated for a reunion with the Workers' Party within the Socialist Workers' Party. I'm pretty sure I might be wrong about that. Um, Yeah, Martin Abern. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah. That's the... Uh, basically the... Um, that's the, what, who, the type of things that are in this book, the authors that are in this book. I want to read the acknowledgments um, here. I must thank the following people for help in producing this book. Mark Osborne sought and found text, as did Ernie Haberkern. Um, Ernie Haberkern, uh, he uh, released his own book, which has, um, which I have videos uh, from in this journal of collections of theories of bureaucratic collectivism. Um, so he has his own kind of version of uh, this book. And I also have, I have a review of both of those books in the same article by Alan Johnson. Um, it has, uh, excuse me, okay, so here it says, it was, uh, Ernie Habakern, Ga Gail Malmgreen, Paul Hampton, and Mike Fenwick. Al Richardson repeatedly put himself to trouble so that I could sift through and photocopy magazines, bulletins in the Socialist Platform Library. Um, I believe Al Richardson, uh, with, I can't remember, I believe Al Richardson wrote a book on the history of Trotskyism in Britain. Um, Phyllis Jacobson, Julius Jacobson, who were like the founders of uh, New Politics, um, amongst other people. Al Glotzer, that's a name I see a lot, but I don't really know the specifics of him. Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker wrote the, is from the uh, Canaanite side of American Trotskyism. But Peter Drucker wrote the uh, biography, the intellectual biography of Max Schachtman. It's called something like Max... Um, Max Schachtman and his left an odyssey through the American century or something like that. Um, and Barry Finger, Barry Finger has, is a editor or was, or is, I think he continues to be an editor of the journal New Politics. He also has articles on the Fathom website, which if you don't know what that is, that's one of the um, websites that I draw on. Uh, or that I use to find articles about uh, contemporary anti-Semitism, particularly left anti-Semitism, but also um, uh, other forms of anti-Semitism. I recommend Barry Finger. He has actually has his own section in uh, Marcel van der Linden's Western Marxism in the Soviet Union about his uh, elaboration of the bureaucratic collectivism theory. Um, Kathy Nugent, Kath Fletcher, Vicki Morris, Alan MacArthur, Tom Rigby. I don't know who Tom uh, Rigby is, but I'll say that Tom Rigby is in um, Marcel van der Linden's Western Marxism in the Soviet Union. You see that name. David Ball, Stephen Holt. <laughs> when I think of Stephen, uh, that makes me think of... Uh... You ever watch Arrested Development where Job's like son or whatever he finds out he has a son his name's steve holt and he decides he wants to be in the kid's life and he's just he keeps yelling out like steve holt <laughs> uh, duncan morrison and john bloxham did typesetting proofreading and production and design work martin thomas i have articles from martin thomas on the youtube channel he's affiliated with the alliance for workers liberty as is uh sean Montgomna. Uh, Martin Thomas did a lot of everything technical. 
Martin Thomas contributed suggestions, criticism, and much discussion to the attempt to trace through and untangle Trotsky's ideas about Stalinism. At the end, Thomas gave me irreplaceable help in cutting down, shaping, and editing part two of the introduction from a draft something more than ten times as long. Jesus Christ. Sean Matt Gomna. Okay. It looks like we are now entering the Russian, the actual introduction, which is titled The Russian Revolution and Marxism. And like I said, I'm only reading the first part for this video. Um, I'm going to put the other sections in their own videos just so, uh, you know, just so that uh, it's, uh, and you know, these are like chapter length sections anyway, um, just so that like we can keep the videos into a, to a manageable length. Um, anyway, starts with a quote. Oh shit, there's actually quotes at the beginning of the thing that I didn't read, um, or like the beginning of like before anything else, so I gotta find it. Okay, there's a quote by Albert Einstein. There's a quote by James Connolly, the Irish Marxist, and Percy Shelley, who was the husband of Mary Shelley, uh, who wrote Frankenstein, who was the daughter of uh, William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, and a poet, and a, a very prominent poet in English Romanticism. I suppose it should say, I don't know if I should say British in Romanticism or English. I don't know. <laughs> English is like a specific, you know, part of Britain. Anyway, quote, We see before us a huge community of producers, the members of which are unceasingly striving to deprive each other of the fruits of their collective labor, not by force, but on the whole in faithful compliance with legally established rules. Production is carried on for profit, not for use. Technological progress frequently results in more unemployment rather than in an easing of the burden of work for all. The profit motive leads to a huge waste of labor and crippling the social consciousness of individuals. This crippling of individuals I consider the worst evil of capitalism, our whole educational system suffers from this evil. There is only one way to eliminate these grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy, accompanied by an educational system which should be oriented towards social goals. End quote, Albert Einstein. Quote, State ownership and control is not necessarily socialist. If state ownership and control were necessarily socialist, then the army and the navy, the police, the judges, the jailers, the informers, and the hangmen would be all be socialist functionaries, as they are all state officials. But the ownership by the state of all the land and material for labor, combined with the cooperative control of the workers of such land and materials, would be socialist. Dot, dot, dot. To the cry of the middle class reformers, quote, make this or that the property of the government, end quote, we reply, quote, yes, in proportion as the workers are ready to make the government their property, end quote. James Connolly. And now I'm going to read a poem by Percy Shelley. Quote, I hated thee, fallen tyrant. Okay, sorry, I forgot I should say the title of the poem. Uh, the poem is titled, Feelings of, Re of a Republican on the Fall of Bonaparte. And here's the poem. I hated thee, fallen tyrant. I did groan. To think that a most unambitious slave, like thou, shouldst dance and revel on the grave of liberty. Thou mightst have built thy throne, where it had stood even now, thou didst prefer a frail and bloody pomp, which time has swept in fragments towards oblivion, massacre, 
For this I prayed, would on thy sleep have crept, treason and slavery, rapine, fear and lust, and stifled thee, their minister. I know, too late, since thou and France are in the dust, that virtue owns a more eternal foe than force or fraud, old custom, legal crime, and bloody faith, the foulest birth of time. Percy Shelley, Feelings of a Republican on the Fall of Bonaparte. Okay, so I gotta get back to the introduction. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay, constructing the socialist order. Quote, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past, end quote. Karl Marx, the 18th Brumaire. If you want to hear something embarrassing... I've never read the 18th Brumaire. Quote, Social life is essentially practical. All mysteries which mislead theory to mysticism find their rational solution in human practice and in the comprehension of this practice. End quote. Karl Marx, Theses on Feuerbach. Eight. Now we can actually start reading some... <laughs> Some stuff. Um, human beings make their own history, but not as human being themselves will it, nor do human beings work in conditions which they can at will control. People follow one intention, holding to one interpretation of their situation and its possibilities, and the result is often not at all what they intended or would have chosen. Sometimes it is the opposite of what was intended and would have been chosen. Other wills, other intentions, and other interests are at work, too, in unforeseen and unknown ways. Afterwards, we do not always easily understand what has happened or why. Sometimes we radically misunderstand. So it was with the Bolshevik Revolution. Early in 1917, the workers, soldiers, and peasants of Russia rose in revolt and destroyed the autocratic czarist monarchy. They organized themselves in democratic councils, parenthesis, Soviets, end parenthesis. On the 25th of October, 1917, according to the Russian calendar in use at the time, the 7th of November, our style, the Military Revolutionary Committee of the Petrograd Soviet, under the leadership of Leon Trotsky, chair of the Petrograd Soviet, organized an insurrection in Petrograd, St. Petersburg, and overthrew the unelected provisional government. At the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, which opened in Petrograd that same day, the 25th of October, a clear majority supported the rising. In place of the bourgeois provisional government, the Congress set up a Soviet government, the rule of workers' councils. The political leadership of the Soviets was in the hands of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, Bolsheviks, at whose head stood Vladimir Ilyich Lenin and Leon Trotsky. The Bolsheviks were Marxists. They understood the working class conquest of state power in Russia to be the first step in an international working class movement to build a new society, free from the exploitation of human being by human being. Quote, we will now proceed to construct the socialist order, end quote said Lenin to the Congress of Soviets on the 25th of October, 1917. What order? The socialist order. But in the event Lenin was not to build, quote, the socialist order, end quote, or even the foundations for the socialist order, the Bolsheviks would suffer total defeat. Not socialism, but Stalinist totalitarianism would arise in the USSR on the grave of Bolshevism. <clears throat> 
the Bolshevik defeat and the unexpected form it took would disrupt Marxism and disorientate the left wing of the world labor movement for the rest of the 20th century. That was not the Bolsheviks' fault, but it was, and is, the abiding consequence of their revolution. What happened to the Russian Revolution? What happened to the socialists who, holding the revolution's original ideas and fighting the Stalinist counter-revolution, tried to make sense of its degeneration and defeat? What happened to the ideas and perspectives of Marxian socialism in the era of Stalinism, in the flux and friction of subsequent social and political life? What was the relation of the October ideas to the Russian Stalinist society that existed from the late 1920s to the early 1990s? These questions are the subject of this book and another to follow. Section 2. The Bolshevik Program. Quote, Whatever a party could offer of courage, revolutionary farsightedness, and consistency in a historic hour, Lenin, Trotsky, and the other comrades have given in good measure. All the revolutionary fervor and capacities which Western social democracy lacked were represented by the Bolsheviks. Their October uprising was not only the actual salvation of the Russian Revolution, it was also the salvation of the honor of international socialism, end quote. Rosa Luxemburg. Um, granted that all quote selection is uh, cherry picking, um, but it's important to note uh, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, criticisms of uh, the Bolsheviks early on in uh the uh in the course of the russian revolution um she died in january 1919 i believe i just want to make sure i'm saying that right yeah she died in january 1919 and uh which was before um so much of uh the uh um, so many important events that would happen um, uh, came to pass. Um, anyway, uh, for uh, introduction, for uh, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, critique of Leninism, uh, look at Adhikar Luban, who is a uh, Rosa Luxemburg scholar. Uh, pieces on here on uh, Rosa Luxemburg's critique of uh, Lenin's ultra-centralism, ultra-centralistic conception of the party, and also Adhikar Luban's uh, piece on Rosa Luxemburg and uh, principles of basic, so basic democratic socialism. Anyway, I know you're just trying to listen to this, but uh, I am going to make comments. Sorry. Socialism in 1917 had a different meaning from what it has had for the most of the last 80 years. Socialism and democracy were understood to be an essential part, one and the other, inseparable dimensions of one indivisible movement, quote, social democracy, end quote, for working class emancipation from wage slavery and from social, economic, and political rule by the capitalist class, quote, social democracy, end quote, aimed to replace capitalist exploitation of wage labor by a, quote, cooperative commonwealth, end quote, in a workers' republic. Lenin and Trotsky defined the nature of the regime they erected on the victory of the Soviet insurrection of the 25th of October as the dictatorship of the proletariat, of the work, wage-working class. They defined Britain, France, the USA, Switzerland, and the other parliamentary democracies at that time as dictatorships of the bourgeoisie, they understood the dictatorship of the proletariat as they understood the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. The role of a class which, quote, dictated, end quote, political and social terms of existence to the other classes. Yeah, it's important to note, I don't remember the exact statistics here of how small the uh, 
working class was, the industrial working class was in uh, 1917 Russia, but I can tell you that um, it was small and that 80% of uh, the population were peasants. So the significance of establishing um, a dictatorship of the proletariat in a country full of peasants um, raises some pretty serious problems for the democratic content of that dictatorship. The, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, was not the dictatorship of a party or of an individual, but of a class. The Soviets, not the Bolshevik party, took state power on the 25th of October. Though without the Bolshevik party, the Soviets could not have taken power and consolidated it. It was in the name of the Soviets and through the Soviets which gave unimpeachable democratic legitimacy to the October insurrection that the Bolshevik party rose to power. The, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, was mass democracy dictating to the defenders of the old order. It dealt ruthlessly with resistance of the old exploiting rulers and their supporters. Um, it's including uh, people on the left as well, it should be said. Um, all the often quoted ferocities proclaimed and enacted by the Bolsheviks concerning the struggle to win power and hold it against armed and mass murdering opponents. All the talk of dictatorship was about the dictatorship of a class organized democratically for mass action in the Soviets and of a party only as representative of that class. And eventually the only representative. The quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, or the rule of the workers, would, as the Bolsheviks understood it, define a whole epoch of history, just as had the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Um, I don't believe, sorry, I'm sorry I keep making comments, but I don't believe that, um, The dict I mean, I don't know about the, the Bolsheviks' understanding of it, but um, in Marx, the idea of like a, a transition period is not a, uh, a whole epoch or a whole uh, society, which is eventually what a lot of Trotskyists are going to come to say, is that it's a transitional um, epoch. Transi Soviet Union is a transitional society with, uh, you know, not that Montgomery is going to say this, but that the Soviet Union is basically more or less, like in the Orthodox Trotskyist conception, um, is more or less a uh, bureaucratically deformed society with, a, with uh, multiple possibilities within it. It can go into a uh, socialist direction if a political revolution is achieved, or it can um, degenerate into a uh, capitalist um into capitalist restoration. Um, so there's, um, what was I going to say? Basically what I was going to say is that uh, this idea of it being a transitionist, transitional society that is fraught with um, risk um, and possibility. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which would be true of like a transition period, um, but the idea of like a whole epoch, um, depending on what your idea of an epoch, is an epoch a period or is epoch, you know, whatever, how many years. Um, so I guess it's a, a little bit of a semantic um, question, but yeah. Anyway, back to the text. Repressive rule, even repression of the old social masters and their supporters by the majority of the people, would be more or less short-term and transitory beginning of at the be and be a more or less short-term and transitory beginning of this epoch. Its conclusion would see the end of force and coercion in human affairs. The Bolshevik Bolsheviks believed with Marx that only that quote emancipation of the working class is also the emancipation of all human beings without distinction of race or sex, end quote. But also and fundamentally that, quote, 
the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves, end quote. The rule of a class, the proletariat, which was itself in Russia a minority, had inescapably undemocratic implications if it was to be imposed against the will of the peasant majority. The new government had the support of the masses of the peasantry and would keep it, even against the peasant parties, until the end of the Civil War, 1918 to November 1920. The first Bolshevik-led government was, until July 1918, so less than a year, a coalition with the left Socialist Revolutionary Party, which shortly after October 25th gained a majority in the Congress of Peasant Soviets. The Bolsheviks did not envisage long-term rule by a minority class in an isolated Russia. The idea of party rule is against Soviet rule, or of Soviet rule being one-party rule in perpetuity, lay far in the future, at the, one, at the other side of the Civil War. In the form in which it is best known to us, one-party rule lay at the other side of Stalin's counter-revolution, the one-sided civil war of the bureaucracy to subjugate the disarmed people. The counter-revolution left intact nothing of, quote, October, end quote, except the emptied and stolen names of the Soviets, Bolshevik Party, Working Class Rule, and Russian Labor Movement. If in 1917 the Bolsheviks were dismissive and contemptuous of parliamentary, quote, bourgeois, end quote, democracy, as indeed they were, it was because they wanted much more than a one-dimensional political democracy. They wanted, quote, social democracy, end quote the real day-to-day self-rule throughout society of the mass of the people. <clears throat> Democracy, as both its friend and enemies, had understood it up until about 1850, rule of the majority by the majority in the direct material culture and spiritual interests of the working majority. They said they would establish a state power, quote, of the Paris Commune type, end quote. In Paris in 1871, 46, earlier, 46 years earlier, the Paris City Council, quote, the Commune, end quote, had seized power in the city and held power for nine weeks before the Parisian workers were defeated and massacred in their tens of thousands or deported to tropical prison islands. I don't know if... Uh, I think it was 10,000 about that was called in the thing, so tens of thousands. This makes it sound like there was multiple tens of thousands, but maybe I'm wrong. How many people were executed in bloody week? Um, it says... 43,000, well, this is on Wikipedia, so this could be full of shit, but 43,522 communards were taken prisoner, including 1,054 women. More than half were quickly released. 15,000 were tried, 13,500 of whom were found guilty. 95 were sentenced to death. 251 to forced labor, and 1,169 to deportation, mostly to New Caledonia. Thousands of other commune members, including several of the leaders, fled abroad mostly to England. That's not what I'm looking for. Ah, oh, damn it. It says ten. It says here in the casualties and losses. It says ten thousand to fifteen thousand killed. In uh, 
bloody week. Um, sorry, I just wanted to see what the death toll was. Um, they had ruled directly without a bureaucracy or a standing army, that is, without a bureaucratic state machine raised above the people. Quote, the commune was formed of the municipal councillors chosen by universal suffrage in the various wards of the town, responsible and revocable at short terms. The commune was to be a working, not a parliamentary body, executive and legislative at the same time. From the members of the commune downward, the public services had to be done at workmen's wages. The whole of the educational institutions were open to the people gratis and at the same time cleared of all interference of church and state, end quote, Marx. In Russia, after the overthrow of the Tsar in February 1917, the Soviets developed a pyramid of factory, district, city, and all Russian representative gatherings. Delegates could be recalled and replaced easily and repeatedly. This was the framework of a, quote, state of the Paris Commune type, end quote, a uniquely flexible and responsive system of democratic self-organization and of increasingly of self-rule by the Russian workers and peasants. The Soviet Bolshevik seizure of power on the 25th of October had put the stamp of security on it. When the Bolsheviks and the Soviets set up the dictatorship of the proletariat in 1917, they acted in the name of democracy and indeed of a higher and more profound form of democracy than what goes under that name in Western Europe, the USA and other places now, not of, quote, dictatorship, end quote, understood as anybody's tyranny over the people. Um, it was uh, precisely this uh, definition, which I definitely think became the dominant um, understanding and affirmatively uh, put forward by many um, Stalinists and uh, related uh, thinkers, the idea of like the dictatorship of the proletariat being this thing which just like exerts forth with force without any um, uh, limitations on itself, um, that it just does what it wants to do without uh, any kind of recourse to some sentiment of like rule of law or uh, rights of human beings. But that's definitely, if you listen to the thing by uh, the piece I have on here that's uh, Alan Johnson's critique of Slava Zizek, and Alan Johnson comes from the same, comes from the milieu of Matt Gomno's party. Um, this is definitely the kind of framework that, let, like, um, understanding of the dictatorship of the proletariat that Zizek seems to be putting forward. This kind of, like, I don't know, this sort of, like, incorruptible, uh, fearless, brutal, uh, emancipatory, in some sense, state that's not held back by uh, any limitations that would seek to, you know, chain it down from excess, chain it, hold it back from excesses that it deems necessary in order to achieve its rule, goals. The, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, fearsome and replete with quite different meanings, though it sounds to our ears after its appropriation and misuse by the Stalinist dictators, was to its proponents in 1917 the democratic self-rule of the working people. Not until later would the terminology of Lenin and Trotsky used by others take on the commonplace meanings it has now. Most of the other key words in the lexicon of the Russian Revolution, of Marxism, and of the left would also, by the mid-20th century, have been given other meaning, meanings. Nor did Lenin's conception of the, quote, social order, socialist order, end quote, involve the wholesale seizure by the worker state of all economic assets, a, quote, command economy, end quote, or a forced march of economic development to, quote, catch up with, end quote, the advanced countries. Their ideas here were fundamentally those of Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto. The working class, having, quote, won the battle of democracy, end quote, would rule in its own and the working farmer's interests, using the state to regulate and control the, quote, commanding heights, end quote, 
Lenin of the society and economy. The Bolshevik government did not immediately intend to nationalize even large-scale industry. They favored and helped create, quote, workers' control, end quote, that is, dual power, between workers and owners in the factories. In 1918, the workers drove out the factory owners and imposed on the government a decision to nationalize, that is, eliminate the capitalists. Um, on uh, the, For the historical record of the factory committees, um, which would have been uh, the instruments of workers' control in this early period of the Russian Revolution and their relationship to... Um, the new Bolshevik state, um, the quote Soviet end quote state, uh, check out the piece, I have two pieces on here that are relevant to that. The first one is titled, I don't know if it's been released yet, it's like in like the stock, like I don't release all my videos at once because then like they're just kind of like, I feel like they just get kind of like crowded out with each other and no one sees them like in their own so I kind of like stagger them. And, uh, but the two pieces that I have is Paul Average, who's a, uh, historian of Russian revolutionary politics. Um, he has a piece called The Bolsheviks and Workers' Control, um, which I got access to by another thing that I have on here by, uh, Stephen A. Smith. And if you don't know who Stephen A. Smith is, he's a very, uh, prominent, um, historian of the Soviet Union and, uh, international communism in general. And he has a piece in, I think it's a critical companion to the Russian Revolution or something like that. But he has a piece called titled Factory Committees. And uh, that's all about the factory committees in the Russian Revolution. Also, uh, for a, a, a view that contradicts Montgomery on the relationship of the Bolsheviks to workers' control, uh, see uh, the book by um, Maurice Brinton. Um, socialism, and I think I can't remember what it's called, Bolsheviks and Workers Control, which I have on the channel, which is like a full book, and it's like a chronology of um, the decimation of working class democracy in the Soviet, um, in, in the Russian Revolution um, that was never ever revived. So that's, those are some resources from which to, if you're interested, to explore the relationship between the Bolshevik party and workers' control. Okay, I'm going to take a break. Thanks for listening. Section 3, The Preconditions for Socialism. Quote, the working class did not expect miracles from the commune. The working class have no ready-made utopias to introduce par décret du peuple. Peuple. They know that in order to work out their own emancipation and along with it that higher form to which present society is irresistibly tending by its economical agencies, they have to pass through long struggles, through a series of historical processes, transforming circumstances in men. They have no ideals to realize, but to set free the elements of the new society which old collapsing bourgeois so with which old collapsing bourgeois society is pregnant, and Karl Marx. Though the Bolsheviks knew and proved to be in practice that the working class could take power, they did not believe that socialism could be created in backwardness and under development such as that which prevailed in the old empire of the Tsars. The Russian economy in 1917 had not developed even the minimum preconditions for socialism. The Bolsheviks believed with Marx that socialism had to be built on the foundations, structures, and social potentialities that the most advanced capitalism had created. Why? In all previous human history, ruling classes embodying advanced culture and knowledge of social organization and administration had owned and administered the economy, society, and the state. They had taken for themselves abundance, luxury, and extravagance at the expense of the mass of the people who were held as slaves, serfs, or wage workers. 
to provide, quote, surplus product, end quote, for the rulers, the subordinate classes had had their consumption rationed and restricted, their lives cramped and curtailed, their economic, social, and political freedom limited to what was compatible with rule by the dominant classes in their own interests. They had been forced to work in conditions and under rules dictated to them by the master classes. Capitalism, for the first time in history, had made possible an end to exploitative class rule by creating a society able to produce the means of life in such abundance that everybody could be guaranteed an adequate minimum. In part, capitalism had even realized it. With the tremendous powers of social productivity unleashed by international capitalism, quote, the last form of class society, end quote, humankind had arrived at a point where it could cut the roots, low productivity of labor and scarcity from which social division and redivision into classes, into rulers and ruled, exploiters and exploited had sprung throughout human history. For the first time ever, it had become possible for everyone to have comfort, culture, and leisure, and thus for humankind to create a society free of the cannibal curse of exploitation, a classless society. The wage working class, the proletariat, which found no class lower than itself in the social hierarchy and which did not and could not exploit any other class, could take power and begin to reorganize society on a classless basis as democratic self-rule. Without the possibilities of the producing plenty created by international capitalism, socialism would have remained a utopia, impossible. With them, socialism became a rational and realistic project for the reorganization of human society to realize the potential which capitalism, its creator, stifles and thus allow humankind to move to a higher level. Quote, Marxism sets out from the development of technique as the fundamental spring of progress and constructs the communist program upon the dynamic of the productive forces, dot, dot, dot. Marxism is saturated with the optimism of progress, dot, dot, dot. The material premise of communism should be so high a development of the economic powers of man that productive labor, having ceased to be a burden, will not require any god or goad and the distribution of life's goods existing in continual abundance will not a demand as it sh does now in any way to me does now in any well-off family or quote decent end quote boarding house any control except that of education habit and social opinion speaking frankly i think it would be pretty dull-witted to consider such a really modest perspective quote utopian end quote Capitalism prepared the conditions and forces for a social revolution, technique, science, and the proletariat. End quote. I'm going to guess that's Trotsky. Trotsky, revolution betrayed. Yeah, I feel like I read that passage before. I'm a genius. Uh, like the modern proletariat that could create it, socialism was necessarily and inescapably the historical child of advanced capitalism. This meant that to Lenin, Trotsky, the Bolshevik Party, and the Bolshevik educated workers who made the revolution, socialism was simply not possible in 1917 Russia. If the workers' revolution in Russia were not part of an international revolution, it would not be a socialist revolution. The Russian working class was a comparatively small minority in a vast land inhabited by peasants scarcely two generations out of serfdom. The country was 100 and more years behind advanced, cha advanced Europe. Circumstances and superb leadership had allowed the revolutionary workers to seize power, but only the spread of the revolution to advanced Europe would allow them to build socialism. The Bolsheviks would have dismissed as impossible and ridiculous the idea that the Russian workers, having seized power, would or could then begin to construct, in parallel to capitalism and in competition with capitalism, a closed-off society on socialist principles. The Bolsheviks understood that in those conditions, socialist principles principles could not for long govern society. Out of economic, social, and cultural backwardness would unavoidably come a regrowth of class divisions. That they believed in, that they believed in Russian conditions could only be the triumph of bourgeoisie and capitalism, of the bourgeoisie and capitalism. They were, as we shall see, radically mistaken in this. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, they didn't see, I think what he means by that is that, um, um, 
insofar as uh, Alliance for Workers' Liberty, oriented around Shab, Sean Metgum, that is third, uh, a third camp Trotskyist organization that uh, adopts the bureaucratic collectivist thesis um, on the social relations uh, created under in the Stalin period. Uh, I'm going to guess uh, that um, what they mean by bureaucratic collect in bureaucratic collectivist thesis is that like a new class society uh, had formed, but um, that society was not a bourgeoisie, but that class was uh, the bureaucratic class um, that uh, installed a society that was neither socialist nor capitalist. So, um, yeah, the idea that class divisions um, would only be formed by the triumph of the bourgeoisie and capitalism is not something that would be uh, consistent. Um, with a uh, bureaucratic collectivist understanding of um, developments in the USSR. Back to the text. The Bolsheviks seized state power, but the Bolsheviks understood that there were proper limits to the use of the surgical and engineering power of the state, that is, of force in relation to society and the people making it up. Their, quote, reshaping reason, end quote, armed with the state power, was limited objectively by the level of the economy and social culture. It could only reorganize, modify, and set lines of development. Society could not be reduced to a tabula rasa, a blank slate on which anything could be written. It could not at will be recreated from the ground up. Society would could not be taken by storm like political power, but only transformed over time. The immense concentration of state power characteristic of Stalinism and the use Stalinists made of it from Stalin's forced collectivization through China's great leap forward to the Khmer Rouge would have seemed to those who formed the government in October 1917 to be a throwback to the pharaoh's Egypt or pre-Spanish Inca Peru. They would have branded the program the Stalinist bureaucrats propounded in October 1924. Uh, excuse me. They would have granted the program the Stalinist bureaucrats propounded in October 1924, building, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, as a regression from Marxism to the utopian socialism of 70 or 80 years previously to the socialism of Robert Owen and Etienne Cabet. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with that statement, um, because, uh, in 1924, um, uh, the Bolsheviks that, uh, were in power, um, uh, were not, um, like, in the, in the, uh, like, in the Stalin period, it's seriously like, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's like, I don't know, 90 out of 100 or like 100 out of 110 or something like that. Like old Bolsheviks were like killed. I'm not exactly sure about the numbers, so just ignore the numbers. But for the sake of argument, um, that didn't happen until the 1930s. Um, and especially in 1924, um, the Bolsheviks of 1917 would be uh, still in play, and it was uh, uh, socialism one country was not only advocated for by or, or appreciated by Stalin. I think it was also supported by Nikolai Bukharin. You could not deny Nikolai Bukharin's uh, Bolshevik credentials. Um, also, it seems to me uh, that. Uh, Um, yeah, I think that the utopianism, the utopianism as represented by people like Stalin and uh, Mao are markedly different from the utopianism of uh, 20th, I uh, mean 19th century people like Robert Owen and uh, Stalinism. Um, Olga Haney, although that's not necessarily what he's saying here. Um, yeah, that's uh, that seems deeply problematic. I'm not exactly know much about Etienne Cabet, so I can't speak. But I 
Let me look them up, actually. When in Rome. I like saying the word, idea when in, word when in Rome uh, when uh, it's not applicable. Etienne Cabet, who lived from 1788 to 1856, was a French philosopher and utopian socialist who founded the Icarian movement. Cabet became the most popular socialist advocate of his day, with a special appeal to artisans who were being undercut by factories. Cabet published Voyage in Icarie in French in 1939 and in English in 1840 as Travels in Icaria. When he proposed replacing capitalist production with workers' cooperatives, in which he proposed replacing capitalist production with workers' cooperatives. Recurrent problems with French officials, a treason conviction in 1834, resulted in five years' exile in England, led Cabet to emigrate to the United States in 1848. Cabet founded utopian communities in Texas and Illinois, but was again undercut, this time by recurring feuds with his followers. Yeah. The idea of replacing capitalism with uh, workers' cooperatives. Um, this kind of uh, utopian socialism of Cabet and Robert Owen um, is not comparable to the utopianism, the extremely authoritarian utopianism. It's not particularly, uh, you know, I think you can do a lot of, uh, force people to do a lot of things with if you have enough guns. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly utopian about it. Um, but I guess the important thing is the idea that, like, Robert Owen and Etienne Cabet kind of had, seemed like they had, like, the, with the cooperatives uh, movement kind of had, like, uh, the idea of socialism in one factory it would be uh, analogous to socialism in one country in some capacity. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry for all my commentaries, but I'm kind of reading this for myself. As I am reading all these things, I'm kind of reading them for myself and then, you know, getting to uh, listen to my thoughts back later. Uh, following imaginary maps of history, as far from social reality as was the chart which guided Christopher Columbus as he thought to the Indies from the real geography of the earth, Owen and Cabet had built doomed primitive socialist colonies in the backwoods of America, thinking to prove the superiority of this, quote, socialism, end quote, in competition with capitalism. That conception of, of socialism had been vanquished by Marx and Engels on the level of ideas and bypassed by history, which had generated a tremendous development of capitalism and of the proletariat and its labor movement within capitalism. Marx had established the all-defining nexus between capitalism, the proletariat capitalism creates, and socialism. The development of capitalism... To me. The tremendous development of capitalism and the proletariat and its labor movement within capitalism. Marx had established the all defining nexus between capitalism, the proletariat capitalism creates, and socialism. The development of socialist labor movements had, Marx's followers believed, shown capitalism's proletariat to be the agency of socialism. Capitalism, which created the social conditions for its own replacement. An economic an economy capable of providing abundance and production increasingly socialized through big firms also created its own grave digger, the proletariat, which would break the power of the capitalist class and take over and develop the progressive potential of the means of production created by capitalism. By the middle of the 20th century, under the impact of Stalinism, the predominant form of, quote, actually existing socialism, end quote, and extrapolated from that, the predominant idea of what socialism was would have turned all this on its head. Socialism, state-imposed forced marches in economically backward countries for the industrial growth and development, which in history and Marxist theory alike was the work of the bourgeoisie and of the bourgeois epoch. In this, quote, socialism, end quote, an authoritarian or totalitarian state held the proletariat and the whole people in an iron grip of terror and exploitation. The model supposedly rooted in the Russian Revolution had nothing to do with the Bolshevik policy of 1917. It was the policy of those who drowned the Bolshevik Revolution in blood, stole its identity and its symbols, and buried it in a falsely marked grave. 
Before the rise of Stalin's USSR, no Marxist could have put forward such a policy as, quote, socialism, end quote, for a backward country without inwardly hearing the voice of the founders of Marxism, insisting that in such conditions, no matter what the rulers' intentions were, quote, all the old crap, end quote, as Karl Marx once forcefully put it, of class society would inevitably return in the first place class differentiation and class exploitation. Classes cannot be abolished by decree or merely because millions of people want their abolition. Classes cannot be abolished unless society has reached the stage where enough is produced for everyone to live comfortably and therefore can dispense with the class structures which human history so far has found indispensable to the development of economy and culture. If in 1917 Lenin knew all this, then... What sense did his proclamation, quote, we will now proceed to construct the socialist order, end quote, make? Lenin did not think he was making and was not trying to make it in any purely Russian sense. He believed the Russian workers were but the advance guard for the German and West European workers, quote, the absolute truth, end quote, Lenin declared on the 17th of March, 1918, quote, is that without a revolution in Germany, we shall perish, end quote. On the 1st of October, 1918, Lenin wrote to Trotsky and Zverdlov, the organizer of the Bolshevik party, quote, we are all ready to die to help the German workers advance the revolution which has begun, begun in Germany. End quote. Lenin. Sorry, Yakov Sverdlov. Yakov Sverdlov lived from 1885 to March 1919. He was a Bolshevik administrator and chairman of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee from 1917 to 1919. Yakov Sverdlov is sometimes regarded as the first head of state of the Soviet Union, although it was not established until 1922, three years after Sverdlov's death. Born in Nitsny Nov. Grad, to a Jewish family active in revolutionary politics, Verdlov joined the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in 1902 and supported Vladimir Lenin's faction during an ideological split. Zverdlov was active in the Urals during the failed revolutions of 1905, and in the next decade, Yakov Zverdlov was subjected to constant imprisonment and exile. After the 1917 February Revolution overthrew the monarchy, Zverdlov returned to Petrograd and was appointed chairman of the party secretariat. In that capacity, Zverdlov played a key role in the planning of the October Revolution. Yakov Zverdlov was elected chairman of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee in November 1917. Yakov Zverdlov worked to consolidate Bolshevik control of the new regime and supported the Red Terror campaign and the de-Cossacking policies. Yakov Zverdlov is also considered to have played a major role in authorizing the execution of the Romanov family in July 1918. Zverlov died in March 1919 during the Spanish flu, flu at the age of 33 and was buried in the Kremlin Wall Necropolis. The city of Yekaterinburg was renamed Zverdlovsk in 1924 in his honor. Some historians have regarded the untimely deaths of prominent Bolsheviks such as Lenin and Zverdlov to have been key factors which facilitated the elevation of Joseph Stalin to the position of leadership in the Soviet Union, partly because Zverdlov served as the original chairman of the party secretariat and was considered a natural candidate for the position, position of general secretary, which is general secretary being what um, Lenin, I mean, Stalin eventually becomes, I believe. This is like official title. Anyway. Back to the text. Again on the 5th of July, 1921, Lenin explained, quote, It was clear to us that without aid from international world revolution, a victory of the proletarian revolution is impossible. 
even prior to the revolution as well as after it, we thought that the revolution would also occur either immediately or at least very soon in other backward countries and in the more highly developed capitalist countries, otherwise we would perish. Notwithstanding this conviction, we did our utmost to preserve the Soviet system under any circumstances and at all costs because we know that we are working not only for ourselves but also for the international revolution, end quote. Lenin. Lenin believed that only in unity with the workers of the advanced countries which were ripe for socialism could the Russian workers begin to, quote, construct the socialist order, end quote. The Russian October Revolution could win its proclaimed goals and survive only as part of an international working class revolution. All its socialist and Marxist legitimacy, all its right to be seen as in the Marxist tradition and not in that of the utopian socialist or the Russian populist, depended on its connection with the international revolution. Section 4. The Isolation of the Revolution Quote, United action of the leading civilized countries, at least, is one of the first conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. End quote. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, The Communist Manifesto the revolution which the Bolsheviks had expected did erupt in Europe, beginning with Germany in November 1918. Soviets appeared all across Central Europe and even as far from Russia as rural Ireland. In 1919, Soviet regimes ruled for a few weeks in Bavaria and Hungary before being crushed by bourgeois forces. In Germany, the workers' revolution threw out the Kaiser and set up a democratic republic. Before 1914, the creation of such a republic would have had a tremendous revolutionary democratic significance. Now it was used as the platform for the bourgeois counter-revolution against the German working class. The social democratic leaders of the German workers had become, quote, Kaiser socialists, end quote, in 1914. In 1918 to 19, though they failed to save the Kaiser, they saved German capitalism. Controlling the German Soviets, they stifled them, slaughtered revolutionaries like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. The Weimar Republic enshrined the rights of bourgeois property in its constitution. It was fundamentally unstable. Hitler was 14 years in the future. In Austria, it was the same. By the end of 1919, post-war bourgeois Europe had weathered the storm unleashed in 1914. Bourgeois control was re-established, the strength of the capitalists in some countries and the strength and loyalty of their, quote, labor lieutenants, end quote, in others, preserved capitalism and isolated the Russian Revolution. Like the first, like the lone first soldier over the parapet into the enemy fortress who finds that no one else has got through, the Bolshevik Revolution was doomed. A gap between Bolshevik intentions and expectations on one side and uncontrollable reality on the other opened wide under the feet of Lenin's regime, shook it out of recognizable shape, and then pulled it down. Other wills, other intentions, other interests, other strivings had cut, acro had cut across and would ultimately nullify the Bolsheviks' will, their hopes, their program. Alongside Bolshevism, international socialism would go down too for the rest of the 20th century. The Bolsheviks, who had will and determination in greater than common measure, did not submit passively to their fate. Though the Bolsheviks had had great and, as it turned out, false hopes, they had never believed that the bourgeoisie would fall like a stone tumbling into an abyss. It would have to be cut down in battle, prolonged battle, so it now seemed. They believed that the world war had radically dislocated the war economy, excuse me, the world economy. Capitalism had achieved no more than a temporary stability in 1920 to 21. The objective necessity and the possibility of a world socialist revolution remained. 
the difficulty, the weakness lay in the, quote, subjective factor, end quote, in the state of the labor movements. The victorious Russian revolutionaries set out to build on the achievements of the International Socialist Conferences at Simmervault and Kintal. I don't know. I don't know what Kintal is. I look that up. The Kintal Conference also known as the Second Simmervault Conference, was held in the Swiss village of Kintal between April 24th and 30th, 1916. Like its 1915 predecessor, the Simmervault Conference, it was an international conference of socialists who opposed the First World War. The victor so back to the text. The victorious Russian revolutionary set out to build on the achievements of the International Socialist Conferences at Simovalt and Kintal in 1915 and 1960s, of which they had been part. A new Workers' International, Lenin had called for it in 1914, when the old international collapse at the outbreak of war was set up in Moscow in March 1919. Section 5 the Civil War Regime. Quote, it would be a crazy idea to think that every last thing done or left undone in an experiment with the dictatorship of the proletariat under such abnormal conditions represented the very pinnacle of perfection. Nothing can be th further from bracket Lenin and Trotsky's and bracket thoughts than to believe that all the things they have done or left undone under the conditions of bitter compulsion and necessity in the midst of the rushing whirlpool of events, should be recorded by the International as a shining example of socialist policy, end quote. Rosa Luxemburg. Full-scale Russian civil war erupted in mid-1918. It would last for two and a half years. The Red successfully contested with the counter-revolutionary, quote, whites for the allegiance of the peasants in the countryside. Looking back at the revolution through the opaque, blood bloodily smeared lens of the Stalinist regime, later commentators have imagined a tyrannical and, quote, be Stalinist, end quote, state machine inexorably working its tank like power against the people in a drive to create a totalitarian state. Later in the century, Stalinist armies and parties calling themselves, quote, communist. One second. Sorry, where was I? Later in the century, Stalinist armies and parties calling themselves, quote, communist, end quote, would do that, taking power as already mighty military bureaucratic machines in Yugoslavia and China, for example. That is not what happened in Russia. To see the civil war that way is to read backwards into past history things that did not and could not exist then. It is to mix up the past pages of two different calendars, that of the workers' revolution and that of the Stalinist counter-revolution. Um, it's important to note, I mean, I don't know what he's going to say in the rest of this, but if he doesn't note the uh, um, severe persecution of uh, other left-wing parties uh, by the Bolshevik state during the Civil War, and after the Civil War, and uh, the uh, very, very uh, serious problems of uh, war communism um, in terms of uh, how that affected the direct producers in the countryside. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be, it, it, it's go it, that, that causes very uh, serious problems for this kind of, uh, uh, for this text. Um, but we'll see what he says. The party that led the revolution was working class. 
unruly, argumentative, and democratic. As late as 1918, its central administration had a staff of no more than a dozen. For a party with hundreds of thousands of members, Bolshevik Party centralism did not produce the authoritarian state. It was the exigencies of civil war and the invasion and evasion that made the Bolsheviks develop strong centralized party machine in the same process that produced the authoritarian state. In October 1917, the working class Soviets firmly controlled only the cities and major towns. In July 1918, the erstwhile partners in government, the left SRs, took up arms against the Bolsheviks. They shot and wounded Lenin because they could not agree to accept peace with Germany on terms dictated from strength by the Kaiser. In order to create the state that existed in 1921, at the end of the Civil War, the Soviets and their Bolshevik leaders had to win the leadership and support of the mass of the people. The peasantry, in a fierce free competition of ideas, leadership and arms with their bourgeois landlord opponents. These were led by czarist generals like Kolchak, Denikin, and Wrangel, and supported by liberals and some of the anti-Bolshevik socialists. No fewer than 14 states intervened to subvert the workers' republic. The workers and peasants chose Soviet power and sought to consolidate it against the bourgeoisie and the landlords. If the urban Soviets and the Bolshevik Workers' Party had not first won the competition for the minds and assent of the rural people, they would never have won the armed contest with the white armies and their foreign allies. The Bolshevik-led Soviets would have been crushed and workers massacred as the workers of Paris were massacred in May 1871. In the course of the Civil War, much changed. This is our central concern here because it, because from it, international socialism would be radically reshaped and redefined. Not their ideas and intentions of 1917, but the exigencies of the Civil War and the wars of intervention determined what the Bolsheviks did. Their democratic socialist Soviet socialist program was subverted and overridden. So ultimately was the socialism of those who rallied to their call for a new working class international. Civil war wreaked great destruction, pushing Russia backwards even from the level of 1917 and that what had, what had seemed possible in 1917. The working class itself was scattered, massacred, absorbed into the machinery of the state or otherwise depleted. Much of industry seized up, self-defense imposed on the revolutionary workers, the need to staff the new immense army and the state machine. Society and industry were subordinated to their struggle to survive and prevail. In the Civil War, the Bolsheviks felt obliged to suppress, insofar as they could, the operation of markets and to substitute a barracks communism of backwardness in which the produce of the peasants was simply seized in order to feed the towns and the armies. Okay, well, at least he's uh, acknowledging that. This was, quote, war communism, end quote. A vast bureaucratic administration of society grew up. Layers of the old bureaucracy and even of the old military bureaucrats, the officers had to be utilized. At first, they were strictly under the control of the workers' party, but soon Stalin would bring the party apparatus under the control of the state bureaucracy. The Soviets, too, the organs of popular self-rule, were subverted by the Civil War. Many of the Menshevik and social revolutionary participants in the 1917 Soviets, the bourgeois democratic opposition in the Bolshevik-led majority in the days of the October Revolution, actively or passively supported the anti-Soviet armies fighting the Bolshevik government and therefore left the Soviets or were driven out. The Soviets, like so much of society, had their life and vitality drained out of them into the work of the army and of organizing a state which administered backwardness and now chaos and economic regression. Um, 
Very soon, the Russian workers had not a state of the Paris Commune type free, easy going self administration, but with minimal bureaucracy, but a heavily bureaucratized state, increasingly modeled on and intertwined with the command structures separ inseparable from the sort of army they felt obliged to create. Yet the Bolshevik regime kept its popular support, it could not have survived without it. Throughout the Civil War, the peasants continued to support the revolutionary government, not without dissatisfaction, bitterness, and episodes of militant resistance, to be sure, in the interest of winning the war against the whites and foreign armies whose victory would have brought back the landowners to lord it over them once more. They supported the, quote, Bolsheviks, end quote, who gave them the land while disliking the armed, quote, communists, end quote, who requisitioned their grain. The revolutionary Social Democratic Labor Party, Bolshevik Party, had changed its name to, quote, Communist Party, end quote, in 1918. It's a common phrase that you know, the Bolsheviks gave us land, but took uh, took everything else, or took the food. Section six: The Post Civil War Regime. Thus, in the process of fighting to survive and prevail, the workers' state had ceased to be what it was in nineteen seventeen. One second. It was now a worker's state because it was ruled by a worker's party acting as stand-in, watchman, gatekeeper, or, quote, locum, end quote, for the proletariat. The locum party ruled in the interest in the name and in the name of the working class in a backward country where the working class was a small minority. Judged by the Bolshevik program, the Civil War regime was already a degenerated workers' state. At the 10th Congress of the Communist Party in early 1921, Lenin himself called it a, quote, workers' state with bureaucratic deformations, end quote. Yeah, and uh, banning of party factions, uh, which uh, ruled out the uh, workers' opposition, so, uh, opposition um, really helped that, those bureaucratic deformations, didn't it? Lenin said that in the course of championing free trade unions, the workers, he believed, would have to fight the workers' state and resist its giant pressure. Um, the course of people uh, championing free trade unions and massive involvement of trade unions in the Soviet Union were de declared anarcho-syndicalist deviationist. Um, this fucking whole thing is full of whitewashes. I'm, like, really surprised. I, uh... I'm really pretty shocked. He said that in the course of the championing free trade unions, the workers, he believed, would have to fight the worker state and resist its giant pressure. Eighteen months later, the dying Lenin used a striking metaphor for the situation of the Bolshevik party at the head of this state. It was, he said, like driving a car in which the wheels did not respond to the steering mechanism. Lenin did not live to analyze it, but this was because an increasingly dominant section of the party had fused with the state bureaucracy. What were the Bolsheviks to do? They undertook now not to, quote, construct the socialist order, end quote, but to survive in power as locum for the working class. The ruling party would defend and serve the working class and develop the backward territory over which they ruled until socialist revolution in the West would come to their aid. The fate of the defeated communards of 1871, the massacres of communist workers in Germany and Hungary and Finland, uh, where maybe a quarter of the entire working class was killed, and the massacres of workers and peasants and the anti-Semitic pogroms unleashed by their opponents during the Civil War, in the Ukraine especially a terrible slaughter of Jews was unleashed by the white armies, kept the Bolsheviks in mind of the alternative. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, you know. Jesus 
The idea that there could be a locum for the working class was a rational, if problematic, response to adverse circumstances. The quote locum, end quote, would grow and develop rationalized by the idea that wholly nationalized property, after the old rulers had been overthrown, was necessarily working class, until it dominated what passed for communism and revolutionary socialism during the rest of the 20th century. The locum, it would be discovered by Trotsky and others itself, have a, so the locum could, it would be discovered by Trotsky and others, itself have a locum. If the Bolshevik party of Lenin and Trotsky after the Civil War could be a locum for the working class, Stalin defending nationalized property after he had buried the Bolshevik party could be the locum of the locum. The idea would, over the next decades, stretch to encompass a wide variety of locums allegedly developing, quote, socialism, end quote, in countries other than Russia, where no working class revolution had occurred. The Bolsheviks never thought that Russia could be socialist on its own. Now something new other than socialism began to develop in the worker state, a result not of Bolshevik intentions or the socialist program, but of backwardness, continued isolation, the exigencies of the long series of wars and the struggle against economic and cultural poverty. In 1921, three and a half years after the October Revolution, a new economic policy put paid to war communism. Markets were restored in which narrow self-interest and the drive for the accumulation of wealth would motivate farmers and merchants under the ultimate control of the workers' state, which, as Lenin put it, would hold, quote, the commanding heights, end quote, of the economy for the working class. Socialism and communism would have been better, but in Russian poverty, this market was better than the primitive communism of the Civil War economy. There's nothing communistic about war communism. Um, if if communism mean has anything to do with uh, uh, any slight slight control of uh, the economic process by the direct producers. Essentially, this was a limited counter bourgeois counter revolution but regulated by the worker state and subjected to its purposes, to control and transition from war communism and to help on amidst devastation and war weariness. The government banned even those parties such as Julius Martov's Menshevik internationalists who had never risen against the Soviet regime or supported those who had. I'll show banning of factions within the parties. You're going to talk about banning of factions. Oh, looks like there's been ban looks like it's going to be mentioned. Soviet government had now become, in fact, what it had so far not either been either in fact or in theory, an institutionalized one-party monopoly. Their theory would catch up as a logical and necessary corollary of the ban on every other political party of the 10th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, March 1921, banned factions within the ruling party's own ranks. Uh, that was uh, not just the party, but uh, Lenin um, leading that. This was a radical departure. In the course of 1917 and the Civil War, there had been many factions in the Bolshevik Party. The emerging measures in 1921 were intended to be a temporary response to an extraordinarily tense and dangerous situation, not the establishment of a permanent regime in state and party or of new forms of new norms, but in fact in this as on so much the emergency measures enforced Bolshevik practice in a backward war-torn country where, where the proletariat was a minority inhabiting urban atolls in an urban, excuse me, in an agrarian sea, came to be the norm and then the theoretical precept for Russia and for most of those calling themselves communists in the whole world. Ideas would change to follow practice that contradicted the initial guiding ideas. 
Section 7. Practice Reshapes Theory. Quote, without dot dot dot, the development of the productive forces dot dot dot, want is generalized. And with want, the struggle for necessities begins again, and that means that all the old crap must revive, end quote. Karl Marx. The new economic policy would last from 1921 until Stalin created the command economy at the end of the 1920s. Under this regime occurred the struggles that would shape, reshape, and disrupt the communist movement. Despite the ban on factions, all the political struggles, the class struggles, and incipient class struggles until 1928 took place inside the ruling party, which had a monopoly on politics. Layers of the ruling party, which in relation to society was already a bureaucracy, based on a much shrunken remnant of the old working class, merged with the layers of state officials carried over from the czarist regime and crystallized into a privileged elite. Groping this, gropingly, this elite developed an awareness of its own distinct political, economic, and social interests. Slowly, the new rulers began to express their interests in the language of a bureaucratically reshaped, disarranged, and miscombined scholastic, quote, Marxism, end quote. This became the ideology of a new privileged class ruling in process of formation. Excuse me. This, this became the ideology of a new privileged ruling class in process of formation and the root theology of its official state religion. In 1924, Stalin proclaimed the goal of the state to be the creation of, quote, socialism in one country. This, he insisted, was, quote, Marxism and, quote, Leninism. The old Bolshevik ideas were now, quote, Trotskyist, end quote, heresy. Quote, Trotskyism, end quote, would be the hood which the counter-revolution put over the head of Bolshevism as it was led to the guillotine. On the level of ideas, the Stalinist drive was connected to and sustained by the idea of building socialism in one country. This led to a wholesale reconstruction and reinterpretation of all the ideas of world communism and of socialism in general. It lay at the root of the monstrous many-branched Stalinist tree of lies about the USSR's, quote, socialism, and thus also about what socialism was what would spread, that would spread its poisonous branches and shoots all through the working class movement for decades to come. The party's political monopoly in the state became the monopoly of the ruling section of the party. The party, a prison for those who resisted the growing power of the bureaucracy, the incipient new ruling class. Before it made itself master of society, the rising bureaucracy first allied with the new bourgeoisie of traders which grew up under the new economic policy, and with, the well, and with the class of well-off labor hire and kulak farmers. The party state bureaucracy raised itself about soci above society, balancing between its working class base and the newly burgeoning neo-bourgeois classes. It stifled working class initiative and used its monopoly to terrorize and control the workers in the party and in the trade unions. Section 8. Lenin against Stalinism. Excuse me, Lenin against Stalin. Quote, Stalin has accumulated immense power. I suggest that the comrades think about a way to remove Stalin from his post and appoint in his place another man who in all respects differs from comrade Stalin in his superiority, that is, in being more tolerant, more loyal, more courteous, and more considerate of the comrades, less capricious, etc., end quote, Lenin. By 1922, Lenin had become greatly alarmed. Lenin saw that the workers were increasingly pushing aside, being pushed aside by the new bureaucratic elite, whose leader and personification was Stalin. The policies of the state were beginning to be shaped by that elite in its own interest and not those of the working class. From the point of view of the working class, the political system needed overhauling, cleansing, and reform. But Lenin was paralyzed by a stroke in May 1922. Lenin's last party congress was the 11th, in 1922. Except for brief periods thereafter, Lenin was removed from the political scene, speechless for months before his death in January 1924. At the end of 1922, in a series of notes from his deathbed, Lenin indicted great Russian chauvinism in the treatment of Georgia. Lenin condemned the all-stifling bureaucratism that made a nullity of the workers and peasants inspectorate in industry, and called for action against it. 
Lenin ended by identifying Stalin, general secretary since the creation of the position in March 1922. He had controlled the party apparatus for a year before that. As the most dangerous figure, the official who most embodied in himself narrowness, bureaucratism, and boorish instinctive brutality. Lenin had been against Stalin's appointment as general secretary, saying, quote, This cook will make only peppery dishes, end quote. But he had not fought Zinoviev, Stalin's sponsor, on it. Now on the 4th of January 1923, he called on the party to dismiss Stalin. But Stalin already controlled the increasingly all-powerful party machine, which was now completely its fusion with the state bureaucracy. I'm not sure. I have to. Uh, I don't uh, have confidence on this, but I don't think that Trotsky was in favor of leaking Stalin's last. I mean, uh, Lenin's last testament about Stalin. I mean, it was buried. Um, Trotsky launched what became the left opposition at the end of 1923. Along the same lines as Lenin's campaign, but with ideas and proposals that were more comprehensive and more fully elaborated. For four years, first the Trotskyist opposition, then the joint opposition of Trotsky and Zinoviev, fought the ever more powerful bureaucracy, demanding a restoration of inner party democracy, better conditions for the working class, and systematic drive for planned industrialization within the system of the new economic policy. Significantly, Trotsky began by protesting against a proposal that the police be used to regulate an internal affair of the party. The ban on factions decreed as a temporary transitional measure at the 10th Party Congress in March 1921 was two and a half years old. Trotsky's earliest co-thinkers, the Platform of the 46, proposed to rescind it. Platform of the 46. I don't know if this is the same thing, but it looks like it is. The Declaration of 46 was a secret letter sent by a group of 46 leading Soviet communists to the Politburo of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on the 15th of October, 1923. The Declaration followed Leon Trotsky's letter, which was sent to the Politburo on the 8th of October and expressed similar concerns and thus laying the foundation for the left opposition within the Communist Party of the Soviet Union later that year. The vast majority of the signatories were executed during the Great Purge. The opposition fought for the material conditions that would make it possible for the workers to exercise democratic self-rule, higher standards of living, more and better industrial jobs, more leisure so that the workers would have time and energy to devote to the affairs of the worker state. They concerned themselves, too, with the health of the Communist International. Everything depended on the success or failure of the broader socialist revolution, of which the Russian Revolution had been only the first part, and ultimately was only a lesser part. Without revolution in the West in the medium term, there would, they were sure, there would, they were sure, be counter-revolution in Russia that would restore the bourgeoisie. The workers' revolution would spread, or would die. Section 9. The Counter-Revolution. Stalin had an unshakable bureaucratic control of the party. When Lenin died in January 1924, a quarter of a million people were recruited to the ruling party, a so-called Lenin levy of aspirants for place and office who would be a solid phalanx of support for the apparatus. Lenin levy. The Lenin enrollment or 
the Lenin's call to the party, Lenin Levy, after Vladimir Lenin, was an effort from 1923 to 25 to enroll more members of the proletariat into the Communist Party and incite them to become active in party affairs. In total, over half a million were recruited. This is according to the Wikipedia. It came in response to growing criticism of the Communist Party by a, as elitist by the rank and file. Even though the party claimed to represent the working class, most of its membership, and particularly its leadership, including Lenin himself, came from the educated classes. The criticism reached a peak at the 10th Party Congress in 1920 when the, quote, workers' opposition, end quote, openly challenged Lenin. Even though Lenin managed to put down the rebellion within party ranks that time, the pressure to make the party more representative of its supposed base could no longer be ignored. Back to the text. In late 1925, the party-state bureaucracy split again. When Zinoviev and Kamenev and the Leningrad organization became alarmed at Stalin's alliance with the, quote, right wing, end quote, around Bukharin, who openly favored extensive concessions to the net men and kulaks. In 1926, they formed a joint opposition with the left, adopting the core policies of the 1923 opposition. The left opposition and the joint opposition feared a capitalist revolution. How did they think this could occur? The NEP bourgeoisie and the bigger farmers who employed wage labor, the kulaks, could hope for backing, the backing of the increasingly dissatisfied middle and poor peasants, with other parties banned. The forces those parties might have represented began to find expression within the ranks of the ruling party, the neo-bourgeoisie through the right wing led by Bukharin. Footnote. The United Opposition, not footnote, this is a, just wanted to look up United Opposition to drill this into my skull. The United Opposition was a group formed in the All-Union Communist Party Bolsheviks in early 1926, when the left opposition led by Leon Trotsky merged with the new opposition led by Grigory Zinoviev and his close ally Lev Kamenev, in order to strengthen opposition against the Stalin-led center. The United Opposition demanded, among other things, greater freedom of expression within the Communist Party, the dismantling of the new economic policy, more development of heavy industry, and less bureaucracy. The group was effectively destroyed by Stalin's majority by the end of 1927, having only had limited success. The left opposition... Excuse me. The Bukharanites were allied with the so-called, quote, center, end quote, faction of Stalin, which controlled the bureaucratized party and state machine. Um, uh, Leon Trotsky, uh, if you, look, if you were, uh, I was just reading uh, um, an explanation of Trotsky's uh, Political Economy of the USSR by uh, Hillel Tickton. And he's a, this, uh, he says that uh, Trotsky regarded, continued to regard the uh, Stalinist bureaucracy as centrist until he died. Um, back to the text. Political power was the keystone that kept everything in place. Government policy would determine the direction of development. Trotsky feared that the Bukharan wing would open the door to capitalist restoration and that the Stalin wing would fail to resist. As against the Bukharan and Stalin and neo-bourgeois wings of the all-embracing party state, or state party, the Trotskyists saw themselves representing the proletariat and the old ideas of 1917 Marxism. Allied with Bukharan and backed by all the conservative and neo-bourgeois forces in the country, Stalin defeated the joint opposition as he had defeated the 1923 Trotskyist left opposition. By the 10th anniversary of the revolution in 1927, the Stalinist bureaucracy was firmly and irremovably in power, allied to the kulaks and bourgeois forces. Stalin told the opposition in the Politburo that, quote, only civil war will remove these cadres, end quote. 
his colleagues and himself. The four-year-old split between the Bolshevik party and the congealed, quote, party, end quote, state bureaucracy was formalized by the expulsion on the 14th of November, 1927, of the real working class party from the ruling state party. Its members were exiled in the wastelands of the USSR or jailed. Two years later, the Stalinist state would shoot its first oppositionists, Blumkin, Silov, and Rabinovich, the precursors of millions who would die within a decade. I'm going to look these people up. Blumkin? Blumkin. That's funny. <laughs> Yakov Grigorievich Blumkin, who lived from 1900 to 1929, was a left socialist revolutionary, a Bolshevik, and an agent of the Cheka and the Joint State Political Directorate. Um, I don't know if this is the same guy. Um, seal of Soviet. Alexander. No, that's not what I'm looking for. No, I don't see anything for Silov and Rabinovich. Yep. Yeah, I'm not finding anything for Rabinovich. Anyway. Back to the text. Uh, two years later, the Stalinist exile... Uh, two years later, the Stalinist state would shoot its first oppositionists, Blumkin, Silov, and Rabinovich, the precursors of millions who would die within a decade. Trotsky, the organizer of the 1917 insurrection and of the Red Army in the Civil War, was expelled from the USSR in January 1929. Early in 1928, a new political economic crisis erupted. The Kulaks withheld grain. The reason the lag of industry, the gap between agriculture and industry, the paucity of industrial goods that the Kulaks could buy with the price they got for their grain. There have been four years of concessions to the Kulaks since a similar, milder crisis in 1923. The Bukharnite right would have continued now on the same road. Most likely that would have led on to something like the scenarios for bourgeois counter-revolution, against which the left opposition had raised the alarm. To Trotsky, it seemed as if the bourgeois counter-revolution was very close. But something startling and unexpected, and without precedent in history, now occurred. Political power had been taken from the workers not by the neo-bourgeois forces, but by Stalin and what the left opposition called the, quote, centrist bureaucracy, end quote. Stalin now turned on his Kulak and bourgeois and Bukharnite allies and crushed them as social forces and social categories and to create to a great extent, as living people, using immense waves of physical force like a quarryman with dynamite, that is, using the state power at the disposal of the bureaucracy to revolutionize society from above, Stalin made his own revolution and began to shape a new socio-economic formation. Having resisted the rational planned industrialization within the new economic policy proposed by the opposition, Stalin now broke the framework of the NEP and embarked on an immensely destructive force march for industrialization and agrarian collectivization. The trade unions were destroyed and replaced by pseudo-unions fascist style quote labor fronts end quote to serve the bureaucracy and the police in controlling the workers. 
All of society was put under the bureaucratic whip and under severe military discipline enforced by savage terror wielded by a state with modern technological resources whose power over society was unprecedented in history. The opposition could not but see in Stalin's industrialization policy something akin to their own. Unsustainable, adventuristic, forced march, unbalanced caricature, bureaucratic savagery, it might be, but nonetheless it was a turn away from the threatening bourgeois peasant counter-revolution. It would be years before Trotsky ceased to believe that this, quote, left zigzag, end quote, would most likely be succeeded by a right zigzag, like that of the 1923 to 28 and concessions to the kulaks who would reemerge from new economic differentiations within the collectivized farms in fact the bukharanite right wing the reflection aside the apparatus of the kulaks and the nep bourgeoisie but also for the bureaucratic leaders of the stifled trade unions crumpled before the stalinists the stalinists drummed up support among the workers for their turn invoking but rigidly controlling the working class quote heaven storming end quote spirit of the revolution the civil war and war communism in face of the turn the opposition began to fall apart zinoviev and kamenev and their followers capitulated to stalin in late 1927 in february 1928 a wave of capitulators from the trotskyist wing of the opposition was led by Pyotok and antonov of Sinko, in July 1929, Radek and Priyabrzhensky led a new wave, and in October 1929, there was yet another. I'm going to look some of these people up. P. Otakov. Piatikov Bolshevik. Grigory Leonidovich Piatikov, who lived from August 1890 to January 1937, was a Ukrainian revolutionary and Bolshevik leader and a key Soviet politician during and after the 1917 Russian Revolution. Pyatikov was considered by contemporaries to be one of the earlier communist states' best economic administrators, but with poor political judgment. Antonov Osinko And the internet's not going to cooperate. Well, I'm going to sort of read that sentence in. In February 1928, a wave of capitulators from the Trotskyist wing of the opposition was led by Piatikov and Antonov of Sinko in July 1929. Radek and Priyabrzhensky led a new wave, and in October 1929, there was yet another. The hardcore around Trotsky and Christian Rakovsky remained. Alongside them were the Democratic Centralist faction, who had gone into opposition in 1921 and concluded in the mid-20s that the working class had already lost power. Trotsky knew that it was not only what was done, but how it was done and by whom, that the bureaucracy cut most heavily against the working class, stifling, persecuting, pushing aside, and displacing the people who were, in Trotsky's view, the necessary protagonists of any socialist development. In world politics, they had wreaked havoc with the Communist International. They were an anti-working class force. The question of, quote, regime, end quote, was of paramount importance. Trotsky criticized the wild and arbitrary production targets set by the bureaucracy, its bulldozing and slave-driving techniques, its suppression of all democracy and all initiative in the working class, the substitution of blind bureaucratic edicts for informed planning, the lack of any system of feedback on the plans decreed from above, the collectivization of agriculture before there existed the machinery to make it a step forwards.
Thus, to newborn Stalinism, Trotsky counterposed a rational, economically balanced, and humane conception of the development of the USSR, a conception indissolubly linked in Trotsky's integrated world outlook to rule by the working class itself in the USSR, to the world revolution and to the perspective and politics of 1917. The proletariat, the supposed, quote, ruling class, end quote, was now subjected to regimentation and terror in the factories and deprived of all civil and human rights, freedom of speech, assembly, or even movement from place to place. Internal passports were introduced. From the beginning of the 1930s, outright, undisguised slavery reappeared. For most of the rest of Stalin's rule, and even later, there would be at any one time be there would at any one time be eight or ten million slave laborers, people condemned on any pretext or none. Slave labor was used, for example, to build the prestigious and, quote, modern, end quote, Moscow underground railway system in the 1930s. Under the direction of Nikita Khrushchev, who in the 1950s as the second bureaucratic czar would reform and humanize Stalin's system. The liberation of women, which the revolution had decreed and despite the backward conditions, in part realized, was reversed. Hungry children of 12 were subjected to the death penalty for theft. Dot, dot, dot. One of the great and most successful achievements of the revolution, its nationalities policy, self-determination and the theoretical and sincerely believed in right to secede from the multinational state was also undone. The rigidly Moscow-centered centralized party state machine deprived the constitutionally enshrined national rights of any meaning because it deprived the national sections of the party, the sole initiating agency of any autonomy. By way of party and state hierarchies, the smaller nationalities were once again bolted in helpless hierarchical subordination to the great Russian nation. The USSR was transformed from a voluntary federation of equal peoples back into a bureaucratic version of the old Tsar's empire, the, quote, prison house of nations, end quote. Lenin and Trotsky had campaigned against great Russian chauvinism. In his deathbed struggle against Stalin, Lenin had denounced Stalin's tendency toward great Russian chauvinism against the Georgians. Stalin was a Georgian himself. Um, Uh, this is kind of a mischaracterization um, uh, to a large extent. Um, Stalin led uh, the annexation, or I guess that's the word, best word to use. Um, uh, the Red Army invaded Georgia, um, replacing the uh, Menshevik-led uh, government. I'm going to read the Wikipedia for that real quick. Uh, the introduction. The Red Army invasion of Georgia from February to March 1921, also known as the Georgian Soviet War or the Soviet invasion of Georgia, was a military campaign by the Russian Soviet Red Army aimed at overthrowing the social democratic Menshevik government of the Democratic Republic of Georgia and installing a Bolshevik regime, Communist Party of Georgia, in the country. The conflict was a result of expansionistic policy by the Russians who aimed to control as much as possible the lands which had been part of the former Russian Empire until the turbulent events of the First World War, as well as the revolutionary efforts of mostly Russian-based Georgian Bolsheviks who did not have, a sufficient, have sufficient support in their native country to seize power without external intervention. The independence of Georgia had been recognized by Moscow and the Treaty of Moscow signed on the 7th of May 1920 and the subsequent invasion of the country was not universally agreed upon in Moscow. It was largely engineered by two influential Georgian-born Soviet officials, Joseph Stalin, Sergei Orzhanikidze, and on the 14th of February 1921 received the consent of the Russian leader Vladimir Lenin to advance into Georgia on the pretext of supporting the alleged, quote, Peasants and Workers' Rebellion, end quote, in the country. Russian forces took the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, then known as Tiflis, I don't know, T-I-F, or Tiflis, T-I-F-L-I-S, to most non-Georgian speakers, after heavy fighting and declared the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic on the 25th of February 1921. The rest of the country was overrun within three weeks. But it, was still not, but it was not until September 1924 that Soviet rule was firmly established. 
on the simultaneous, simultaneous occupation of a large portion of southwest Georgia by Turkey from February to March 1921 threatened to develop into a crisis between Moscow and Ankara and led to significant territorial concessions by the Soviets to the Turkish national government in the Treaty of Kars. Um, so, yeah. so, like, rudeness and being um, a cultural Russian chauvinist is bad, but invading the country uh, is good. Uh, now the Stalinists proclaimed anew the Tsarist doctrine, the pernicious nationalism that was of the smaller Russian traditionally oppressed nations, not the nationalism of the dominant great Russians. Soon there would be active persecution. National subsections of the Stalinist party were repeatedly purged to make the USSR safe for Russia, great Russian chauvinism. For 50 or more years, there would be russification programs in the Ukraine in the 70s, for example, and even the forcible transportation of small nations like the Crimean Tatars and the Chechens in their entirety from one end of the USSR to the other. In the 1920s, anti-Semitism was already being used by the Stalinists against the opposition. It would gradually become a big force in USSR life until the early 1950s. Stalin was running a raging worldwide campaign against, quote, Zionism, end quote, staging show trials in satellite countries such as Czechoslovakia and preparing the show trial of the, quote, Kremlin doctors, end quote, most of them Jewish in Moscow. That might have been the starting point for surrounding up and deporting the Jewish population of the USSR, or for Stalin copying Hitler on this on other things and slaughtering Jews. Stalin died in 1953, and his successors abandoned the scheduled trial of the Kremlin doctors. Yeah, there was a, something I've heard about... Um, uh, Uh, what was I going to say? Um, I was going to say that there is, like, talk about, like, there was a plan for Jewish, um, deportation of Jewish people to, uh, somewhere within the Soviet Union, uh, prior to Stalin's death, but I am not sure, um, where, uh, what the content of that was. Yeah, there's a book. I mean, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, I need to know more about this. Um, yeah, I can't find anything about it on the internet. I'm not probably not doing the appropriate right search. Um, by every possible measure of politics, culture, economy, and human relations, Stalinism was counter-revolutionary. Its prerequisite had been the defeat of the working class and the oppositions in the struggle between 1923 and 1927 to 28. Yet it was not a capitalism restoring counter-revolution. It was a bureaucratic counter-revolution in which the state bureaucracy led by Stalin wiped out both the new grown bourgeois classes and the Russian labor movement. It destroyed all the defenses and the rights of the working class and turned the peasants into slave-driven, expropriated serfs of the new bureaucratic state. Who now ruled, the bureaucracy ruled, in whose interest its own. The working class cannot own industry except collectively, and therefore it can only rule itself in industry through democratic political self-rule. In the system established after 1928, as Trotsky should, would put it in 1936, quote, the means of production belong to the state, but the state, so to speak, quote, belongs, end quote, to the bureaucracy, end quote. 
The October Revolution had ended in defeat for the working class and indirectly in the creation of a strange new socioeconomic formation. Quote, other wills, end quote, adverse conditions, the brute necessities of the struggle, changes in the function and thinking of key people and layers, and the cumulative defeats of the working class and the opposition had by now changed virtually everything. Stalin had led a section of the old Bolshevik party, a layer of politically short-sighted people, and behind them a much larger layer of the tired, the self-seeking, and the relatively well-off. In the mid-1930s, almost all of Trotskyists in Siberian exile would be slaughtered. So would almost all the leaders of the 1917 revolution. Most even of the original Stalin faction would die. The 1934 Congress of what was now after the defeat of the Trotskyists and the Bukharanites, indisputably their party, was called the Congress of Victors. By 1938, 1,108 of the 1,966 delegates to that conference had been killed in Stalin's Great Purges. Society was crushed beneath the power of the gigantic, all-controlling Leviathan state. A large range of privileges regulated and controlled by the state existed for the bureaucracy, which would have its own special shop selling goods unavailable to others in a parallel economy that was a separate consumer system for the elite. Trotsky, summing up the experience on the eve of his assassination in 1940, said that the bureaucracy had, after, had, the bureaucracy had after 1928, made itself, quote, sole master of the surplus product, end quote. The same drive to maximize those resources in the hands of the central bureaucracy led after 1929 to, quote, nationalization, end quote, of everything that twitched in economic life, to a degree and with a thoroughness that in Marxist terms would have been inappropriate for a far more developed economy, or indeed for any existing economy. One consequence was Russia's transition from an authoritarian regime to an outright totalitarian state. The Bolshevik Party's composition and its role in society had changed and changed again until the party had fragmented it and ceased to be itself, and it had become impossible to identify continuity except in the forms and names, forms now filled with radically different content and names, naming, names naming different things. From the worker-composed leader and defender of the workers in Lenin's time, to the worker-rooted bureaucratic state power raised above the workers to balance between the classes, until 1928 to 30, after 1928 to 30, the rigidly authoritarian quote sole master of the surplus product end quote end of society. But with the revolution ended, but while the revolution ended in outright defeat for the working class and for socialist hopes. Those who rose to power on its defeat continued to proclaim, and Stalin may have believed it, that in their rule, working-class socialist rule was alive in the USSR and going from triumph to triumph. Thus revolutionary socialism was transmuted from the great clear cleansing truth of the October Revolution into the great lie of the 20th century. Section 10. I think I'm actually going to break this video down into uh, portions because it's a very long essay and no one's going to read watch a five hour video. Um. Um. So section 10, the communist international. Quote, socialism in one country, end quote. The organizing dogma of the bureaucracy was a radical break with genuine Marxism, with the Bolshevik conception of the Russian Revolution and with the Marxist idea of the place of socialism in the evolution of human society. On the level of ideas, it was a strange reversion to utopian socialism, a socialism that would emerge in the wilderness on the margins of capitalism and by competition over decades vanquish it. 
for socialism to be built up in a backward country, leaving aside the question of whether such a regime of scarcity and backwardness would be socialism, excuse me, could be socialism, implied decades at least of peaceful development in which the capitalist world would leave the USSR alone. It implied the belief that there would be no socialist revolution in any other country. For the non-Russian communist parties, it meant, and the logic would work itself through in the 1920s, that they were not primarily revolutionary parties in their own countries, but frontier guards for the Soviet Union, foreign legions to be used as the Russian bureaucratic ruling class thought fit. The duty was to work for Russia's advantage, irrespective of the consequence for working class struggles in their own countries. The entire Marxist conception of the Russian Revolution and of the Communist International was thus inverted. From the 1920s, the effects of Stalinism on the non-Russian Communist parties ensured that these parties accelerated there, where they might have reversed the degeneration of the Soviet Union. The Bolsheviks after 1920 understood that capitalism was in a fundamental state of disequilibrium and disruption in and had managed only a temporary post-war stabilization. The chance of a new working class, excuse me, the chance of new working class revolutions had not gone. It was an epoch of wars and revolutions. Defeated Germany was both fundamentally unstable and quote rotten ripe end quote for the socialist revolution aborted in 1918 to 19. There it will be socialism or fascism. The bar to the international revolution was the state of the working class movement itself, the necessary protagonist of the revolution. The Bolsheviks had set out with the Communist International in 1919 to rebuild the revolutionary movement. The degeneration of the Bolshevik revolution made the problem worse. Ultimately, it made it intractable for those like Leon Trotsky who continued Bolshevik politics after the triumph of Stalin. Just as the bureaucratization of the ruling party in Russia nullified the nominal autonomy of the USSR's republics, subordinating them by way of militarized hierarchical bureaucratic control to Moscow, so the Stalinist rise to control in the Soviet Union welded the Communist International to the ruling Kremlin bureaucracy. <coughs> Russian hegemony was there from the start, rooted in the real achievements of the Bolshevik party. It was exercised at first primarily by way of reason and debate, and by the political and moral authority of the Bolshevik leaders. The Stalinists used bribery, bureaucracy, and then terror by the Russian political police outside the USSR with no scruples. They purged the international. The leaders of the French party and the Italian party, for example, backed the opposition in the early and mid-1920s. The German party was taken through four generations of leaders before the fifth, round. Tellman, uh, Ernst Tellman, it's, it's spelled weird here, uh, proved docile enough for Stalin. Under the banner of, quote, Bolshevization, end quote, began the process of stifling the communist international's internal life, subordinating everything to a rigid hierarchy centered in Moscow. By the late 1920s, Moscow's control in the international was akin to that of hold, a hold-up man pointing his gun. The organizational, moral, and financial authority of the, quote, international, end quote, at the, at the revolutionary militants of the communist international. The communist international is used with undiluted cynicism as a mere collection of overseas supporters of the Soviet Union who could, with proper, quote, Marxist, quote, dialectical, quote, explanation, end quote, be got to do and say virtually anything. In Spain during the Civil War of 1936 to 39, Stalin and his Spanish party, stiffened by the Russian political police, suppressed the working class revolution. Stalin's aim was, by doing the work of fascism, to convince the Western bourgeoisie that they did not need fascism. The communist parties could do the job for them, if they should ally with the USSR to contain Hitler. Stalin w would control, and where necessary kill, the quote, the quote, Bolshe, end quote, workers. The Stalin turn could do anything. From 1934, the Communist International preached a crusade against fascism and then, more narrowly, against German fascism. Stalin signed a pact with Hitler on the 23rd of August 1939 and joined him in mid-September to invade and partition Poland. The Communist Party switched round and denounced Britain and France as warmongers against peaceful Hitler.
They made propaganda for Germany. The hardcore working class base of the Communist parties followed the leaders of the Soviet Union because they thought they shared a common anti-capitalism with them. There had been an enormous loss of the understanding that was the basic to the politics of excuse me, that was basic to the politics of socialism. By now there was utter befuddlement about what their own working class alternative to capitalism must be if it were to bring working class liberty. Yet, even though they were tied to a ruling class worse than their own, they believed excuse me, they behaved like revolutionaries. Future Stalinist dictators like Matthias Rakosi, uh, I believe that's Hungary, and Eric Honecker, uh, who was not the first, but I believe the second uh, leader of East Germany. I think he was the leader still uh, in 1989 when it collapsed. I'm not sure about that. Um, as a side note, um, I believe, I'm not exactly sure of this, but um, this kind of uh, throws her uh, you know, critical theory uh, revolutionary uh, put, uh, credentials into the garbage can. Uh, Angela Davis uh, visited students in West Germany and then afterwards uh, I think met with Eric Honecker uh, to uh, you know discuss uh, you know, the world revolution or something like that. Um, I'm not exactly sure about that, so I don't want to be spreading rumors, but I think that is the case. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely the case. If you look at Angela Davis and uh, Eric Honecker, um, it shows a picture of her standing on a podium right next to Eric Honecker. So to paint her as like a faithful student of like, Herbert Marcuse would be deeply, deeply questionable. Anyway, future Stalinist dictators like Matthias Rakosi and Eric Honecker spent many years as prisoners of Hitler and Hungary's Admirable Ho Admiral Horty. The French Stalinists behaved with great courage when the signal came in 1939 to go into outright opposition. Many might have been relieved that the class collaboration era of the Popular Front was over. When Hitler invaded Russia in June 1941, the Communist parties again became the best patriots of Britain, and after December 1941, the USA newly allied with Russia. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but in, 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 I believe that the Communist Party USA, in addition to supporting the No Strike Pledge, um, also supported the internment of the Japanese citizens in internment camps. Um, and also, I think in the pages of their periodicals, uh, celebrated the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I, I'm not exactly sure about that. I believe that I read that in Barry Fingers, uh, one of Barry Fingers' pieces about bureaucratic collectivism. Um, I'm not sure, though. When Hitler invaded Russia in June 1941, the Communist parties again became the best patriots of Britain and after December 1941, newly allied with Russia, they became chauvinists and strike breakers. In Britain, Communist Party leader Harry Pollitt, who had balked momentarily at the Hitler-Stalin pact, pronounced the beginning of a new epoch in which, quote, it is the class-conscious worker who will cross the picket line, end quote. In the USA in 1944, the Communist Party advocated that the striking coal miners be conscripted and forced down the pits under military discipline. Everything for the war effort. Jews, more than any other people, were the victims of the convulsive crisis of mid-20th mid century capitalism, driven from country to country, persecuted, massacred. <clears throat> 
In this hard school and drawing on a culture conducive to sweeping conclusions, large numbers of Jews, and not only workers, learned about capitalism and enrolled in what they thought was the working class fight to overthrow capitalism and replace capitalism with socialism. Attitudes to Jews and to anti-Semitism were a defining question of a whole age. On this question, at least, the Communist International, especially in its anti-fascist phases, seemed clean and on the side of sanity and humanity. Yet even here, Stalinism overlapped with Hitlerism. Trotsky pointed out the plain elements of anti-Semitism in Stalinist policy. For example, the insistence on the original Jewish names of men known for decades as Trotsky and Kamenev and Zinoviev. Anti-Semitism had been used against the opposition in the mid-20s. In, the in 1940, the Mexican Stalinist invade against the, quote, Jewish Trotskyist, end quote. It burst out in Eastern Europe in the late 1940s as a campaign with repression and show trials against, quote, Zionism, end quote, that was only thinly disguised anti-Semitism. Footnote. Oh, there's a footnote. The Communist parties followed suit and created a culture that is still with us, especially now in the ranks of would-be Trotskyists as, quote, anti-imperialism, end quote, focused on Israel, where the Jewish population now and the Jewish national minority in the 1930s and 40s are deemed to have no rights to exist as a nation or to defend themselves. End footnote. At every turn, people would leave the communist parties outside Russia. If they happened to be refugees living in Russia, they would be slaughtered as foreign communist refugees were during the Moscow trials. The Polish Communist Party, denounced as incurably infected by Trotskyists and Luxembourgers, was dissolved in 1938, and its membership list surreptitiously given to the Polish military dictatorship's police. But always quote, the party, end quote, defined fundamentally by its allegiance to the USSR, would go on or be rebuilt around a new policy and with new drafts of members. In the course of the Second World War, the Russian Empire already dominated dozens of, quote, its own, end quote, smaller nations, expanded enormously. It clawed, into, clawed in the East European states and half of Germany. Imperialism? No. The Socialist Revolution. Imperialism? That is only another name for what the big capitalist powers do. Here, too, we find the turning of things on their heads and inside out. The annexation of words by their opposites. An arbitrary confinement of words to mean only what preconceptions and ideology could tolerate allowing them to mean. Quote, for reason and revolt now thunders, end quote. Thunders the international. International. This was the revolt sustained over many decades against reason, and the destruction of both the tools of reason and the propensity to reason. The Catholic Church long ago developed a dogmatic escape clause to, quote, explain, end quote, the accumulated absurdities of its doctrines. A doctrine like the Trinity, God is both one person and three, in fact arose out of the incoherent amalgamation by the church bureaucracy of once bitterly hostile doctrines. It makes no sense. That, says the church, is a, quote, mystery of religion, end quote. It makes a higher sense above human reason. You don't need to understand. All you need to do is have faith. The Stalinist used, quote, dialectics, end quote, in exactly that way. Everything is relative, fluid, changing, historically conditioned. Stalin understands. Keep the faith. You could not get further from reason, from Marxism, from Marxist dialectics, or from the old socialism that had set out to make war on all thrones, pontiffs, and dictators. Yet all these attributes belong to a movement which waved the banner of Lenin's and Trotsky's revolution, which seemed to talk in the language of Marxism, and which claimed to propound a system of ideas that codified the historical experience of the revolutionary workers' movement. For decades, these people defined what socialism, Marxism, and communism were. The communist parties were the biggest parties of the working class in France and Italy, smaller but still imposing in countries like Britain. 
They attracted working class militants. They pursued the class struggle in their own way and for their own goals, but only in ways and with means consonant with Moscow's interest, and they pursued it only until it was in Moscow's interest to betray it. Okay, I think I'm going to cut the reading off here, and that will be the end of um, that will be the end of the section. Section eleven. Uh, this is the beginning. Um, this is not how the text is organized, but for the sake of making uh, YouTube videos. I'm going to put this into uh, its own uh, start a new section because I don't want any of my uh, videos to be too, too long. Um, it's an extended essay by Sean Matt Gamna on the Russian Revolution. And uh, I want to... Um, uh, I want to make it something digestible, you know. Uh, having a YouTube video that takes, you know, perhaps days to listen to was... No good. Okay, but this new section, starting part two, that I've ar arbitrarily uh, designated, is titled is uh, Section 11 of the essay and uh, the counter-revolution within the forms of Marxism. Uh, the governing ideas of any society are those of the ruling class, argued Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in the German ideology. The unfalsified ideas of the 1917 revolution could not serve the new ruling elite. The, quote, Marxist, end quote, forms and phrases could, filled with radically new and different social, class, and historical content. Quote, Marxism, end quote, like the collectivized property and other forms seized by the Stalinist, was not simply overthrown, but retained and altered to serve the new bureaucratic rulers in the social struggles of the 1920s. Their state, quote, Marxism, end quote, became for the Stalinist bureaucracy what the doctrines of the Orthodox Church had been to Tsarism, but with enormous international ramifications derived from Moscow's control of the Communist International. Stalin's counter-revolutionary struggle against Leninism took place in the name of Lenin. This fight against communism in the name of communism, against equality, in the name of future communist egalitarianism, against Marx, in the name of Marxism, against any form of democracy, in the name of a higher democracy. The totalitarian bureaucracy enslaved the workers and the rural, rural population in the name of working class freedom. The dictatorship of the proletariat was replaced by the dictatorship of the bureaucracy from, quote, within, end quote, without a re clean rupturing of forms or an open, honest break with socialism. From, the, from that grew up Stalin's dictatorship of the lie, this was the typically nightmarish, surreal world of Stalinism, a world of double talk and double speak where, quote, trade unions, end quote, were not trade unions, quote, Soviets were not Soviets, quote, socialism was not socialism, quote, Leninists were not Leninists, quote, democracy was not democracy, and where the worker enslaving bureaucracy appropriated to itself the right to speak as the working class. Contrast what happened in the French Revolution. The political counter-revolution against Jacobinism, started in 1794 by a section of the Jacobins, soon turned into a reaction against all Jacobins. Quote, terrorist, quote, Montagnard, quote, Jacobin, became terms of abuse. In the provinces, the trees of liberty were chopped down and tricolor cockades trampled underfoot. Why did this not happen in the Soviet Republic? Because, quote, the totalitarian party contained within itself all the indispensable elements of reaction, which it mobilized under the official banner of the October Revolution. The party did not tolerate any competition, not even in the struggle against its enemies. The struggle against the Trotskyists did not turn into a struggle against the Bolsheviks because the party had swallowed this struggle in its entirety, set certain limits to it, and waged it in the name of Bolshevism." End quote. Thus, in 1940, at the end of his life, Trotsky looked back over the strange and unexpected course of events that had led to the triumph of Stalinism in the USSR. Um, that's from a uh, footnote. That's from uh, Trotsky's book, uh, Stalin. Something akin to this, quote, bureaucrats Marxism, end quote. Quote, Marxism, reworked in Baudlerized, 
to express interest other than those of the socialist proletariat had developed once before in Russia. For a while, important sections of the Russian bourgeoisie and petite bourgeoisie had expressed their interest in a dialect of Marxism. In the 1890s, anti-Tsarist intellectuals who wanted to break with the old heroic and self-sacrificing gun-in-hand tradition of, quote, Narodnik, end quote, populist resistance to Tsarist tyranny in the name of the, quote, people, end quote, and of a rather ill-defined utopian socialism had become, quote, Marxist, end quote. They came to stress only that, quote, anti-utopian, end quote, part of Marxism, which said that capitalism was progressive and unavoidable. Thus, they licensed themselves to make peace with developing Russian capitalism. These so-called, quote, legal Marxists, end quote, soon became liberals. The revolutionary working class Marxists, future Mensheviks and Bolsheviks alike, agreed that capitalism was inevitable and progressive in Russia, but combated the one-sided bourgeois Marxism. If they had not done that successfully, the militant Russian labor movement had, that made the revolution would not have developed. The new hatched state bureaucrats who took over, quote, Marxism, end quote, and gutted it, took it over from, quote, inside, end quote, from a position of leadership and of dominance over a worldwide segment of the working class and its movement. The revolutionary Marxists of around 1900 had been able to base themselves on a raising, rising working class movement in their defense of an unfalsified working class Marxism. Those who resisted Stalinized, quote, Marxism, end quote, in the USSR had no such base. Indeed, the responses of the Bolsheviks themselves, as they held on against all odds in the circumstances in which isolation had trapped them, had created a powerful base for the gestation of a new bureaucratic pseudo-Marxism and a world organization for its dissemination. This happened despite the struggle to the death of Trotsky and the Bolshevik rearguard against the Stalinist counter-revolution. The Bolsheviks held on by way of tremendous and brutal exertions against the, quote, other wills, end quote, operating inside and outside Russia, and, so doing, they extemporized a first draft of what the Stalinist counter-revolution, overthrowing the ruler, rule of the workers, would develop into an elaborate bureaucratically drawn root map of history, that was as fantastic as any drawn up by the mid-19th century utopian socialist colony builders. This they imposed on the army of revolutionary workers who had been grouped in the Communist International. While the parties of social democracy remained tied to the bourgeoisie, except for the bourgeoisie had knocked them on the head, as in Germany, the Communist International which had been set up to recreate independent working-class politics in opposition to social democracy, was captured by the new anti-capitalist bureaucratic Russian ruling class. With the million-strong Communist International and its semi-militarized parties as transmission belt, the government ideas of the new bureaucratic ruling class in the USSR dominated the revolutionary workers in capitalist, industry, in capitalist countries. The workers who still looked to the October Revolution for a lead and an example. In consequence, during the convulsive mid-century crisis of capitalism, the revolutionary workers' movement was removed as an independent factor from world politics. That, in a sentence, is the story of 20th century, 20th century socialism from 1914, when the Socialist International collapsed, to the disintegration of the USSR in the 1990s. Inexorably, the corruption spread into every key idea of socialism and Marxism and to every model of behavior, endeavor, and precept of socialism and Marxism. Exigencies that determined so much of what was done in Russia became the source of general theories dogmatically applied to all conditions under the guiding whip of the self-serving bureaucratic rulers. Already the Bolsheviks had erred in this direction. Stalin, representing an anti-working class, new ruling class, made it a system, and suppressing all dissent, an airtight, lightless system designed to serve the new Russian rulers. What Stalin did and said, and what Stalin said Lenin had done or said, or would have done or said, that was Marxian socialism and, quote, Bolshevism, end quote. All the basic shaping, morale engendering, old left-wing ideas were twisted inside out and turned round into their opposites as the bureaucrats took over, quote, Marxism, end quote, and gutted it. Specifically, what they did was take all of Marxism that was negative and critical of bourgeois society and bourgeois democracy 
and cut off the positive working class Marxist alternative to capitalism, social democracy, expanded liberties, and working class control. In their place, they put their own bureaucratic anti-working class alternatives, bureaucratic rule and totalitarian state power, miscalled socialism. Here they followed the pattern of the reactionary or feudal socialists criticized in the Communist Manifesto. Quote, incisive criticism striking the bourgeoisie to the very heart's core, dot, dot, dot. In political practice, they join in all coercive measures against the working class, end quote. The Marxist criticism of the limits and the shallowness of, quote, bourgeois democracy, end quote, became a condemnation of it supposedly in the name of progress, but in reality in the name of political regression to before the French Revolution, if not before the Renaissance and the Reformation. Uprooted, too, were all the best old, quote, bourgeois, end quote, notions of liberty, ideas which preceded mass democracy and were inseparable from it. Section 12. Revolution and Democracy. <laughs> quote, to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class, to win the battle of democracy, end quote. Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, The Communist Manifesto. In 1917, Lenin, Trotsky, and the Bolsheviks had believed that unless the revolution unleashed a great deepening and broadening of democracy, it would fail. We must pause and examine the question in some detail, for it is one of the central issues posed by the degeneration and defeat of the Bolshevik Revolution. Marx and Engels had written in the Communist Manifesto that to make the proletarian revolution was to, quote, win the battle of democracy, end quote, and make the working class the ruling class. Everywhere, including Russia, the socialists had, under the influence of Marx and Engels, been ardent champions of parliamentary democracy and democratic liberties. Labor movements in the 19th and early 20th centuries fought to extend the suffrage and enlarge the power of parliaments, often by revolutionary means. In Belgium, they organized general strikes to win the vote. Marxists had made the democratic tradition their own. It was not for any other reason that they called themselves social democrats, advocates of democracy in all, not only the political aspects of society. Always and everywhere, the socialists were for extending and unfettered so mean, for an extending and unfettering democracy and for cutting down the prerogatives of capital and the power of government and bureaucracy. The creation of new working class forms of democracy began in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1905, when striking workers who did not have political rights elected their own local parliament, the Council of Workers' Deputies, or, quote, Soviet, end quote. The drive for democratic self-rule overflowed existing institutions and led to the creation of new specifically working-class democratic institutions. After October 1917, revolutionary-minded people all across the world recognized the Soviets as the working-class form of democracy. Commitment to Soviets, workers' control within which there would be a plurality of, quote, Soviet, end quote, parties, became a central part of the program of revolutionary socialism. Inevitably, the Russian reality after 1921, one party rule in Soviets withered and curtailed, confusion many, confused many communists about exactly what, quote, Soviet rule, end quote, was. The more the Stalinists turned the USSR into an unprecedentedly savage, exploitative dictatorship, the more they proclaimed it to be the purest and fullest democracy ever. Democracy? That, like socialism, is whatever exists in the USSR. The result in a short time, was to banish concern with anything that had before 1917 been considered democracy, and to falsify the very language and conceptions of the socialist movement and the earlier communist movement on the fundamental question. Even before full-blown Stalinism, quote, communism, end quote, acquired an anti-democratic basis, rooted in experience of the Russian Civil War and its aftermath. It was, quote, Leninism, end quote, understood as Lenin himself would not, Rosa Luxemburg was surely right on that, have wanted it and understood it, to me, have wanted it understood and used. After the full-scale Stalinist counter-revolution of the late 1920s, the one-party system was proclaimed as the true working-class democracy, universally applicable. The, quote, parties, end quote, Right to a political monopoly was written into Stalin's 1936, quote, democratic constitution, end quote. 
The very idea of socialism as democratic self-rule was thus confused, pulped, and destroyed. Democratic ideals and goals that had been central to radical thought since the French Revolution or even since the English Revolution of the 17th century had their vocabulary appropriated to endorse extreme versions of the statism and authoritarianism which the left had been fighting against for hundreds of years. Mystification, confusion, and soon an almost indecipherable corruption of language and ideas followed. This was the fault not only of the revolutionaries or even the Stalinists. In the hands of the right wing of the international labor movement, the old socialist commitment to perfecting the democratic institutions of capitalist society had become a commitment to defend the bourgeoisies against the revolutionary workers and their Soviets, which were the realization of all the old socialist drive for expanded democracy. In Germany, the bourgeois democratic regime set up by the 1918 revolution became the vehicle for a landlord bourgeois right socialist counter-revolution against the workers. The old drive for radical social democracy was thus ground to nothingness by the upper millstone of the bourgeoisie in Stalin and the nether millstone of social democracy. What the Social Democrats did with, quote, democracy, end quote, softened up the revolutionary workers to receive the Stalinist revolution that all the old talk of democracy was nothing but bourgeois lies. Democracy became increasingly indefinable. Norms were corrupted until the existence or non-existence of democracy became not something that could be measured by commonly agreed standards, but a matter of assertion and counter-assertion. Here, as in so many other fields, the Stalinists took over and caricatured what the bourgeoisie did. They, this helped destroy the norms by which the revolutionary workers could have evaluated the Russian claims that Stalinist totalitarianism was democracy. The association of, quote, democracy, end quote, with the right wing all across Europe in the 1920s and 30s, and then its collapse into country after country, so, and then its collapse in country after country before authoritarian right wing regimes or fascism, helped ease revolutionary workers into acceptance of the one party Stalinist totalitarian state as the true working class democracy. This lie became an article of faith for two generations of revolutionary workers. Those who eventually saw it for the oxymoronic absurdity it was, tended as a rule to collapse back into acceptance of the bourgeois counterfeit of democracy. The basic idea that socialists must continue to struggle for human liberty and freedom was expunged from the program of, quote, communism, end quote. Quote, democracy, end quote, like, quote, socialism, end quote became a cynical catch cry, shot through with double think about the quote socialist democracy, end quote, of the society where the Stalinist bureaucrats ruled with neither socialism nor democracy. The hazard of taking seeming for the hazard of taking seeming for identity is strong here. The Bolsheviks and the early communist international did impatiently denounce, quote, bourgeois democracy, end quote, did counterpose direct action to parliament, did abuse the democratic pretensions of the reformists, did advocate general strikes and insurrectionary tactics. But, as has already been said, always and everywhere, what they counterposed to, quote, bourgeois democracy, end quote, and to constitutional methods was mass action, majority action, or action that would quickly become majority action and could not succeed if it didn't. Led by communist parties which were free associations within which democratic norms of debate and decision-making were taken for granted, what they counterposed to parliamentarian me, what they counterposed to parliamentarism was the Soviet system, conceived of as a more radical, real, thoroughgoing, and responsive form of democratic mass self-rule. To confuse this with what Stalin made of it is to falsify history. Indeed, it is to walk in the track of long-established Stalinist falsifications. The Stalinists removed the positive alternative that the Bolshevik Party and early Communist International opposed to the bourgeois, quote, democracy, end quote, quote, narrow constitutional methods, end quote, and quote, parliamentarism, end quote, which they denounced and put in its place their own totalitarian alternative. The very idea of democracy, workers' democracy, or any democracy and of liberty against the state disappeared, except in words that in fact now denoted their very opposites. Bolshevik, quote, discipline, end quote, the discipline of a voluntary association of socialists became rigid. 
hierarchical, semi-militarized submission of the communist parties to control by Moscow, a police state became the model for both their, quote, socialism, end quote, and their, quote, democracy, end quote. These workers' movements were not under their own control. They could not steer their own course or learn from their mistakes. Section 13. The New, quote, Religion of Socialism, end quote. Quote, Feuerbach starts out from the fact of religious self-alienation, of the duplication of the world into a religious and a secular one. That the secular basis detaches itself from itself and establishes itself as an independent realm and the clowns can only be explained by the cleavages and self-contradictions within this secular basis. The latter must therefore in itself be both understood in its contradiction and revolutionized in practice, end quote. Marx, Theses on Feuerbach. As, quote, democracy, end quote, lost all real meaning, so too did, quote, socialism, end quote. The model for a socialist economy became the airtight, autocratically, quote, planned, end quote, command economy of the USSR, in which even small corner shops were statified. Quote, socialism, end quote, came to be measured by success in industrializing a backward and underdeveloped economy, that is, in doing the work which had so far been done by capitalism in history, and doing it by a slave driving under incomparably severe totalitarian dictatorship. A tremendous leader cult, with Stalin as Pope, Caesar, and pseudo-tribune of the people combined, developed in the USSR in the 1930s. There too, Stalin and Hitler learned from each other. The intellectual life of the international, quote, communist, end quote, movement centered on interpreting, augmenting, justifying, and implementing papal pronouncements from on high, assertions that often flew in the face of known reality or of the, quote, line, end quote, of the day before, and on the, quote, sacred books, end quote, the misappropriated books of Marxism that said many true things but could only, quote, speak, end quote, for today as the high priest of Stalinism interpreted them. Quote, proof, end quote, was defined as citations from the, quote, four great teachers, end quote, Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin. This was, quote, Marxism, end quote, degraded into a pigeon philosophy for the bureaucratic, excuse me, the bureaucratic parvenus and their Caesar Pope at the head of a new state religion. The centrality in Stalin's, quote, new Marxism, end quote, <coughs> of the idea and practice of forcibly industrializing a backward country by autonomous state power gave it a power of attraction in underdeveloped countries for individuals and masses with no interest in socialism or as conceived of in 1917. By the end of his life, Trotsky would come to describe the attractions of this, quote, Marxism, end quote, for the leaders of the Stalinist parties thus, quote, the predominant type, dot, 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 is the political careerist, dot, dot, dot. Their ideal is to attain in their own country the same position that the Kremlin oligarchy gained in the USSR, end quote. Uh, that's Trotsky, uh, 1939 to 40. In the 1970s, for example, a sizable section of the educated middle class and the technological elite of the armed forces in Afghanistan made up the Stalinist party there. And in the years before their failure led to the Russian invasion of December 1979, they tried to transform themselves into a new ruling elite, aping the Russians. The totalitarian state not only laid down standards in art and literature and music for the communists of the whole world, by the 1940s the Russian state was even laying down the conclusions biological research should arrive at, appointing Trofim Lysenko Pope or, quote, Stalin, end quote, in this sphere. Culture became a subsection of the Ministry of Police. So did every idea capable of expression fall under police regimentation and, regu and regulation, so did the ideas that had dominated and defined socialism so far. When the Stalinist Pope pronounced that the old socialist ideas about equality had never been part of Bolshevism, but were the petty bourgeois but were a petite bourgeois deviation, 
Nobody who was under the direct control of the Stalinist police, or who wanted to remain in the Communist parties, could dissent or even quibble and try to qualify it. The Soviet Union, an imaginary Soviet Union, was both Vatican and heaven of the Stalinist religion, dot, 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 to those who did not have to live in it. The Stalinist, quote, religion, end quote, was bureaucratically enforced and patrolled by the GPU, and not only inside the USSR. The acceptance of this system indicated a self-debilitating immaturity and underdevelopment in the communist movement. The international Stalinist labor movement's, quote, secular basis detached itself from itself, end quote, and became idealized not in the clowns but beyond the seas and mountains. The successive defeats epoch-defining in the case of the victory of Hitler in Germany, to which the Stalinists led the working class, enhanced the value and sharpening the need for the quasi-religious consolation offered by the myths of the myth of Stalin's quote socialist fatherland end quote the quote sun city end quote beyond the mountains end quote. The disease of nationalism in 1914 had meant the international labor movement splitting into many interwarring national parts. Now, communist international unit international, the communist international unity, conceived in 1919 as internationalist unity for combat against capitalism, served to enforce international working class prostration before a narrow and brutal Russian nationalism, that yet somehow was the highest form of internationalism under the, quote, red, end quote, czar, who yet somehow was not a czar. The mystifications and befuddlements and a mass working class element of culpable fantasy and unreason define this movement of frequently heroic would-be revolutionary workers as unfit to rule even its own affairs. All of this was a tremendous regression. All the old socialist ideas of the relationship of means to ends of subject and object of the proletariat as the protagonist of modern history, of what socialism was and was not, gave way to pre-bourgeois ways of thinking and organizing and to relationships between people within, quote, the movement, end quote, that were the very opposite of those appropriate to socialism and to the preparations of socialism. Workers rooted in the modern class struggle of their own advanced capitalist countries had their ideas dictated and their strategy set by the Russian ruling class, their collective performance in the class struggle shaped and reshaped to suit the needs and interests of the class-hostile bureaucratic Russian rulers. Where Marxism, even the cautious Marxism of West European socialist parties before the Russian Revolution, had rejected, quote, saviors from on high, end quote, and seen the working class itself as its own liberator and its own movement, as the center of the forces of liberation, now something else was central, the, quote, worker state, end quote, the living socialism beyond the border, the heaven over the seas and beyond the mountains to which the world movement was subordinated. The building of socialism somewhere else was everything, the Communist Party's alleged goal is nothing. A, a name here that I want to look up. Um, it says George Julian Harney, who lived from 1817 to 1897, was a British political activist, journalist, and Chartist leader. He was also associated with Marxism, socialism, and universal suffrage. Uh, in the mid 19th century, readers of the Red Republican. George Julian Harney's paper, where the Communist Manifesto first appeared in English, in 1850, were avid for accounts, which the paper provided, of Etienne Cabet's socialist colonies in America. That was where socialism was. Now in a very much more developed workers' movement, Devotion to a utopia far away was repeated on a gigantic, hugely distorting scale. Socialism was again something being built somewhere else, not except in ceremonial speeches that meant nothing in practice, the goal of the class struggle inside your own capitalism. Enormous regression. Quote, no saviors from on, on high, to, excuse me, quote, no saviors from on high deliver, end quote. 
The great socialist republican message of the international was amended, in fact, to mean saviors and popes only from the liberated lands and the higher socialist civilizations far away. The parties so guided were vigorous forces on their own terrain. They drew their strength from working-class revolt. They took the will for change, the courage, the hope, the capacity for self-sacrifice, and the life-enhancing idealism of generations of revolutionary working-class militants. But their guiding principle was all for the workers' fatherland, for socialism somewhere else. Thus they destroyed generations of revolutionary militants. Quote, communism, end quote, became first a rigid and rigidly organized sect whose sole core belief was an infallibility of Stalin and the Soviet Union, and later a spectrum of competing Brezhnevite, Maoist, Castroist, Titoite sects. Beyond faith in the leader and the, quote, party, end quote, any belief, alliance, loyalty, or aspiration could be annulled and anathemized overnight, and new beliefs put in its place. Much of the devotional literature of, quote, communism, end quote, consisted of lies and fantasies about one or another socialist fatherland, and, vi vici vi assume, and vicious libels against socialism and socialists, especially the unreconstructed Bolsheviks. Thus, by the middle of the second quarter of the 20th century, the most militant segments of the great working class movement, built up over three quarters of a century in political and ideological recoil from utopian socialism, reverted to a variant of utopian socialism, focusing on the vast anti-capitalist utopian, quote, colony, end quote, in the USSR, whose socialism was an edifice of lies and falsifications and whose rulers were more savage in every sense than any other ruling class. The effect on the labor movement was justly compared by Trotsky to syphilis and leprosy. Section 14. The Bolshevik Rear Guard. Let me get some water. Quote, the worst thing that can befall a leader of an extreme party is to be compelled to take over a government in an epoch when the movement is not yet ripe for the domination of the class which he represents and for the realization of the measure, measures which that domination would imply, dot, dot, dot. What a leader of an extreme party can do is in contrast to all his previous actions, to all his principles, and to the present interest of his party, what he ought to do cannot be achieved, end quote. Friedrich Engels. The second worst thing, in the Russian case, it flowed from the first, is for a revolutionary party to have its banners, symbols, and erstwhile language appropriated by a powerful state and its dupes overseas who proclaim plausible counterfeits of its goals as theirs and use them to serve alien interests. It cannot reach its own people. Its place in politics is usurped and ruined. Those it would help to victory misled to defeat and catastrophe. Perhaps an epoch of history will have to pass, bringing its own slow clarifications, before it can come into its own. By then much will have changed, and it will itself have mutated and have to define itself all over again. So it was with the incorruptible and unbreakable Bolsheviks, the Marxists who stood out against the bureaucratic counter-revolution and the Stalinist falsification of the ideas and perspectives of Bolshevism. They fought the new Russian ruling class even before it was fully formed and before they had learned to recognize and define him. The surviving Bolsheviks, led by Trotsky, had to start again from almost the beginning. Now they faced adversity and complications such as the older Marxist movement had never known. In a nightmare world in which all their banners and symbols had been annexed and appropriated to be used against them. A dozen years on from October... The international socialist Bolsheviks were reduced to a numerically marginal force, politically expropriated and seemingly bypassed and outmoded. The, quote, perspectives, end quote, on which Lenin and Trotsky had oriented themselves in 1917, the worldwide dislocation of capitalism and the opportunities the worldwide dislocation of capitalism provided again and again in country after country for the working class to overthrow capitalism were still valid if the labor movement could take its opportunities. Yet now, the Communist International formed to push aside the social democracy and organize the working class to settle accounts with capitalism, 
was a force that acted against socialism with a brutality, discipline, consistency, and lethal effect that pro-capitalist social democracy had matched only in Germany in 1919, if even then. Out of the victory of 1917 had come the most debilitating of defeats. Lenin and Trotsky knew they could be defeated and possibly massacred. They did not imagine this sort of defeat or this massacre of ideas of Marxism and socialism. Not only did the Bolsheviks take power, then find themselves unable to realize their program and forced to implement, in whole or in part, another program, but then a seeming facsimile of their program was seized and annexed by their conquerors. Quote, all the old crap, end quote, did reappear, but disguised as the best realization of its very opposite. Stalinism permeated the socialist program. It petrified it as calcified chemicals seep into the cells of trees to turn the organic wood into another substance, stone. The consequences for socialism can only now, after the fall of the USSR and its empire, begin to be undone. Against the communist parties, after the mid-1920s, competed tiny groups led by Trotsky, representing and embodying the ideas of the 1917 revolution, but with few resources. The existence of state-licensed Stalinist Marxism made their work uniquely difficult. In addition, they would be half-buried under an enormous USSR-inspired and financed deluge of misrepresentation, slander, and persecution, including murder. To the Stalinist counter-revolutionaries and to the millions of revolutionary workers who followed them, these representatives of the ideas of October and in the first place Trotsky, the organizer of the October Rising, were Mensheviks, reactionaries, white guards, and fascists. Their identity, like their banner, had been stolen by the new Russian ruling class and its agents. The unreconstructed Jacobins and poor people of Paris had experienced something like this when they, the slogans of liberty, equality, and fraternity under which they had made the French Revolution were seized by the bourgeoisie who came to power after the revolution had cleared the way for them and crushed the people. The bourgeoisie gave the old revolutionary slogans their meaning. They rendered the revolution unrecognizable and unacceptable to those who had made it. Under the self-same slogans or the same broad ideas, an alien class had harvested the state power. The revolutionary ideas were not sharp enough and clear enough to make them undetachable from those who thought they had blazed a path that would lead to a world very different from the one that they had. Ideas are porous. Reality is richer and more complex. It possesses potentialities that are not to be seen in advance. The Democrats of the 1830s and 1840s in Britain and elsewhere had seen their ideas seized and corrupted in the 1850s and 60s when democracy was tamed by the bourgeoisie, deprived of democracy's earlier radical social dimension, and turned into something other than what it had been for friends and enemies alike since the French Revolution and earlier. Quote, I ponder all these things, and how men fight and lose the battle, and the thing they fought for comes about in spite of their defeat. And when it comes, turns out not to be what they meant, and other men have to fight for what they meant under another name. End quote. That's from William Morris. A dream of John Ball. Dream. A dream of John Ball. The Bolsheviks' experience after Stalin's, quote, second revolution, end quote, in 1928 had much in common with those earlier experiences. Of course, socialists had known and repeatedly said that state nationalization of industry was not socialism, that it could only serve socialist working class goals if the workers held social and political power. These ideas had differentiated Marxism from Fabianism and middle class reformism. In its spiraling degeneration, the Russian Revolution presented the problem differently. Nationalized property there was rooted in the Great Revolution. Though the Bolshevik party and the revolution had been destroyed, the manner of their destruction was unexpected. The result was unprecedented and therefore mystified and disorienting. Both, quote, the Bolsheviks, end quote, end quote, the October Revolution, end quote, seem to have survived, despite the program-rooted expectations of those who led the revolution that there would be bourgeois counter-revolution in Russia, if the workers' revolution did not spread to the advanced countries, there had been no bourgeois counter-revolution. The bureaucratic counter-revolution that had taken place said it was Bolshevik socialist working class.
The Stalinist counter-revolution was not only a counter-revolution within the property forms established by the worker state, but also, as we saw, a counter-revolution within the forms of the old governing Marxist ideas. When it snuffed out the remnants of working-class political power and seized the means of production, the new ruling class seized, quote, Marxism, end quote, too, twisting, changing, and bowdlerizing the old ideas, turning the old Marxist language into a liturgy of state and the sacerdotal language of a bureaucratic, quote, socialism, end quote. When the rising collectivist ruling class and its process of separation from the old party created a pseudo-Marxism that deconstructed and dismantled the Marxism of October, it inflicted its worst possible because all-embracing defeat on Bolshevism. One consequence was to prevent the re-emergence of a replacement for Bolshevism. The taking of power in 1917 turned out to have been a kamikaze exercise, not only for the Bolshevik party in its physical existence, though ultimately it was that, but kamikaze for a whole political doctrine. The Trotskyists had to rebuild Bolshevism in a labor movement doubly poisoned, by its open enemies and by the Stalinist impostors, against, quote, Bolshevism, end quote. The task proved impossible. The, quote, battle of ideas, end quote, is central to the outcome of class struggle. Here was Karl Marx's idea that, quote, the ruling ideology of an epoch is that of the ruling class, end quote. Confronting the international revolutionary movement in a new form as an international extension of the new USSR ruling class, assiduously purveying a counterfeit of the old Bolshevik ideas and maintaining a worldwide organization with vast resources and no scruples or restraint to impose its version of, quote, Marxism, end quote. Bad slogans drove out good. Opulent counterfeits nourished by the processes of the USSR, excuse me, nourished by the successes of the USSR, occupied the place of the genuine Marxism, possessing power and wealth, that of a ruling class, unimaginable to the older labor movement. The bureaucracy could define what it decreed to be Marxism, Socialism, Leninism, Bolshevism. Money, prestige, quote, red professors, end quote, in their version of academia and police, jails, and concentration camps could and for decades did make good the claim. The bureaucrats' great power to set the agenda for large parts of the labor movement could sustain it. The past was blurred, half-blotted out, and quote, overwritten, end quote, with the bureaucracy's myths of its own origins, purposes, and pigeon Marxist ideologies spread among revolutionary workers along paths laid down to and from the USSR in the days of Bolshevism. When parody and pastiche and scholastic kitsch, quote, Marxism, end quote, became the creed of the mass revolutionary labor movement, revolutionary Marxism confronted the most murderously hostile environment it had ever had to face, a political world in the grip of nightmare and delirium such as no liberating movement had faced since the mysticism enshrouded primitive revolts of the religion-bound Middle Ages. Those in the Bolshevik Party and the Communist International who resisted the rising Stalinist bureaucracy had to dispute with those who, in possession of the, quote, conquest, end quote, of the October Revolution, were plausibly the heirs of Lenin exactly what was and was not Marxism, what was and was not Bolshevism, what was and what was not the proper policy and modus operandi for the communist parties in capitalist countries, what was and was not the necessary socialist working class perspective on the evolution of the USSR. They fought an immense, entren immense entrenched state power which presented itself as the real, the victorious, and therefore better embodiment of the ideals proclaimed also by the anti-Stalinists. To side with the opposition needed courage and clarity. It meant standing with a tiny persecuted minority against a vast multitude who seemed to have the successful and prosperous variant of the same ideas. Moreover, the revolutionary socialists had the disadvantage of seeming to accept the core claims of the Stalinists. The Soviet Union was, they said, an immense gain, though they criticized the bureaucrats' methods and their rule. Its economic successes were the decisive practical proof in history so far that collectivist economy worked. So said even Trotsky. The representative experience of the proto-Fourth International is that of Germany from September 1930, when Hitler made a spectacular electoral breakthrough, to the 30th of January 1933, when Hitler became Chancellor, and the few weeks after that, before the Nazi grip had taken the German labor movement by a throat, during which effective resistance was still possible. <clears throat> 
Trotsky understood Hitlerism early. Trotsky raised the alarm in good time. In pamphlets and articles, he warned the German labor movement, criticized and advocated proper anti-fascist tactics for the whole German labor movement. Despite Trotsky's warnings, the social democracy remained the supine conservative force it had been for 20 years. The German Communist Party made violently pseudo-revolutionary statements and competed with the Nazis by mimicking their ideas. They too called for the, quote, national liberation, end quote, of Germany, and by intermittently allying with them against the social democratic labor movement, even to collaboration with the Hitlerites in the breaking of social democratic le social democrat-led strikes. They insisted that Hitler fascism was neither the main danger nor the only, quote, fascism, end quote. Here the confusion about, quote, democracy, end quote, must have been a big element in getting German communist workers to accept the idea that Hitler's victory was not uniquely threatening to the very existence of the German labor movement, communist and social democratic alike. To the Communist Party, the main enemy was, quote, social fascism, end quote, the social, democ the social democracy, the old enemy of the traitors of 1918 to 19, the, quote, murderers, Excuse me, the quote, murderers of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, end quote. Still a common refrain of people who would have also killed Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Um, the couple of hundred Trotskyists were unable to make themselves heard by those who could shape and reshape reality. They could not break through the barriers of bureaucratic organization to influence social democratic workers or surmount the barricades of Stalinist slander to influence communist workers. The unquiet ghosts of old Bolshevism, still abroad in the world but no longer a force in it, they were able to see and understand but no longer able to touch reality and shape it. Revolutionary Marxist theory was divorced from the revolutionary-minded workers and thus from the possibility of practice. To the Stalinist workers, the oppositionists were the, quote, Trotsky fascists, end quote. To the Social Democrats, the unteachable old Bolsheviks, to the working class at large, people outside their own organizations, heretics, renegades, defeatists, or agent provocateurs in the service of the enemy. By the time Hitler came to break its back and smash its skull, German communism was a quasi-religious mass cult in which the Stalinist popes and bishops operating like the medieval church by ideological terrorism supplemented by physical repression had outlawed the propensity and capacity of the party to think and driven unauthorized, quote, discussion End quote, underground. The Trotskyists? People sacrilegiously questioning the most sacred doctrines and pouring scorn and venom on the image of their leaders and teachers. Alien petty bourgeois, quote, revisionist, end quote. Subversive of the revolutionary enterprise. To disobey or disagree was to place yourself outside the great army of the revolutionary proletariat, outside the revolutionary party on which so much depended. Trotsky was right. For seeing events clearly and in good time to arm the workers, truthfully warning the German labor movement that it was faced with imminent destruction, and yet he was starkly cut off from any possibility of affecting events. In Germany, Trotskyism was Bolshevism without masses, arguing perspectives that required masses, in conditions where the very life of the German working class movement was at stake. This was to be the fate of Trotskyism in history. Trotskyism would be shaped and reshaped by it. After the German Communist Party surrendered to Hitler in 1933, um, that's, a, um, that's a little bit of an intense statement. The Communist Party was destroyed by Hitler in 1933. Um, um, when was the Reichstag fire? 1934? Yeah, okay, so the Reichstag fire happened the month after Hitler was made chancellor, so that's a little, and, you know, uh, what was it, what was the fucking act called, the emergency, yeah, the Reichstag fire decree. Uh, yeah, the Reichstag fire decree. Uh, was issued by President 
German President Paul von Hindenburg, on the advice of Chancellor Adolf Hitler on the 28th of February 1933, in immediate response to the Reichstag fire, the decree nullified many of the key civil liberties of German citizens with the Nazis in powerful positions in the German government. The decree was used as the legal basis for the imprisonment of anyone considered to be opponents of the Nazis and to suppress publications not considerably, quote, friendly, end quote, to the Nazi cause. The decree is considered one of by historians as one of the key steps in the establishment of a one-party Nazi state in Germany. Um, and the first people who were arrested were uh, communists. Um, Um, where am I? So, back to the text. After the German Communist Party surrendered to Hitler in 1933, Trotsky declared the Communist International dead and set out to build a new international, the, quote, fourth, end quote. The forces were very small. The proponents of the new international would have to do the same work as had been done for the nascent, quote, third, end quote, Communist International, the Simmerwald and Quintal conferences in 1915 and 1916 after the collapse of the old international at the outbreak of war in 1914. But there were no victories like that of 1917, out of which the Third International, out of which grew the Third International. Defeat followed defeat, disaster followed disaster, massacre followed massacre at the hands of the fascists and the Stalinists. A new movement had proved necessary, but also as Europe moved to a new world engulfing war, impossible. The fundamental difference between the prospects for the nascent Third International in its day and the stillborn Fourth lay in the existence and character of Stalinism, a rich and powerful pseudo-revolutionary force with a stable base in the USSR that allowed the Communist parties to survive any political shift, zigzag, or glaring contradiction. This was not politics as hitherto known in the labor movement, but a variant of the state-serving politics hitherto confined to the bourgeoisie. These parties, alternating in power, would, despite differences, commonly serve the fundamental social status quo, the rule of the bourgeoisie. In the Stalinist parties, policy zigzags occurred repeatedly within one entity, defined by the interest of the USSR ruling class. This would charge... This would change the map of the labor movement's political world, intruding into it a bureaucratic force as powerful and unscrupulous as the state and the ruling class it served. The laws of history are stronger than the bureaucratic apparatus, Trotsky would write. In fact, the Stalinist apparatus inserted a reshaping force into history, not forever, as one, once seemingly all-powerful Russian Stalinist rulers would learn in 1989 to 91, but for a whole epoch and enough to derail confuse and crush progressive forces falteringly moving forward in the class struggle. The strength of the Stalinist apparatus against whole societies and against more easily dispersible and destructible labor movements made up a voluntary association of workers with something new in history. In Germany, Spain, and France, Stalinism acted as one of the two giant millstones which ground into nothingness labor movements, which had they had been able to develop might have reconstructed society on a higher socialist level. By the time Trotsky died on the 21st of August 1940, the European labor movement had been pulverized. Accepting Britain, Finland, Ireland, Switzerland, and Sweden, fascism and authoritarianism ruled Europe. To the east, Stalin had erected a bureaucratic throne above the grave of the Russian labor movement. Trotskyism was an epiphenomenon of the early communist international a critical satellite of the mass parties of the Communist International, despite trying to reorient them, and then a disabling weak competitor with both the Communist International and the older social democracy. Trotskyism was armed with the unfalsified ideas, goals, and perspectives of 1917 Bolshevism and early Communist International in a capitalist world rushing towards disaster and the biggest and most destructive war in history. The contrast between what followed the collapse of the Communist International in 1933 and the aftermath of the collapse of the Second International in 1914 was decisive for the subsequent history of Europe. In 1914 and after, Kaiser Socialists and their counterparts in other countries had visibly and audibly broken with old ideas. There is resistance led by Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, Clara Setkin, Franz Mehring, Otto Rula, and others, which swelled and grew in response to events.
1916, the German social democracy split. Radicalization grew, especially after the Russian Revolution of 1917. Revolutionaries rallied to the clean red banner of October. After the decisive collapse of the Stalinized Communist Party in 1933, nothing was clear-cut. The bureaucratic Russian state twisted and shaped everything. In 1933 and afterward, the Trotskyist opposition did not appear boldly and clearly as the revolutionary opposition, nor the Stalinists as renegades who had served the enemy and helped destroy the most powerful labor movement in Europe. Decisively, the Stalinists had not gone over to the bourgeois enemy. They were demagogically very left-wing and, quote, revolutionary, end quote. They served the anti-capitalist Russian bureaucracy. There was neither freedom to organize in the communist parties, nor the possibility of open discussion, nor now was there unadulterated Marxist education to build on. There had already been a decade of radical miseducation, of systematic falsification of the ideas of Marxism and the Russian Revolution. The very language of Marxism had been corrupted and reduced to emotion-bearing demagogic arbitrary catch cries. It would be like that with national variations all through the 1930s until war reshaped the world anew and for a whole epoch closed off the perspectives on which the Communist International of 1919 had organized itself. Okay. Well, that's kind of annoying. Um... Apparently there is a part two. Um, so uh, I'm going to end this section. And um, I said before that I was going to uh, arbitrarily set a part two. But now that I've realized that there is a part two, uh, I'm no longer going to do that. So thanks for listening. I hope you got something out of this.